Hello and welcome to another Sunday show. This week we're taking a look at the German Wehrmacht during its last year of operations, 1944 to 1945. We'll begin in about January of 1944 when the German military was still fairly powerful but clearly on the decline at a time when the Allies were increasingly organized, experienced, and were able to really field both uh, quantitatively and logistically superior forces on pretty much every front. So basically what we're doing is looking at the German army as it faces its final challenge and as it is slowly pounded to dust. So joining me this evening, as usual, is Sean Chick. So Sean, how are things going? Hey. I'll probably just have to replace this computer. That's why we're delayed tonight. I'm just having a lot of problems with it right now. Yeah, I mean, I'm actually yeah. impressed uh, the computer went as long as it did. <laughs> Probably helps that I don't play video games or do anything that tire that taxing on it. It's, you know, it's mostly just used it for uh, for writing and internet and research, really. Yeah, I mean, that's mostly what I use <laughs> my computers for too, except for videos, of course. But even doing the kind of videos I do can still really do a number on computers. That's why I use this yeah. one pretty much uh, before, just for streams and recording. Yeah, that's a good idea, actually. Um, I wanted to say before this one, uh, are you still having problems with getting the super chats? Do I need to do the screenshot method so we make sure we get everything tonight? Um, I will be more free tonight to write things down. Uh, I'll be able to keep track. So, okay. it's not too much All right, worry. So you're, so you're going to be keeping... Uh, so you're going to be keeping track of that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that won't be a problem um, tonight, at least. In the future, we'll have to do something else to deal with that problem, since YouTube is not super helpful at recording basic information. Um, okay, another announcement. That's goofy. Tomorrow morning at about 10 in the morning, I will be going on another podcast, someone else's channel. The channel is called Bite Marks, Bite with a Y, and then Marks is in Karl Marx. So it's kind of a play on words. Uh, get it? Anyway, uh, it's about the history of video games and the interaction of video games and culture. I'm not sure exactly what we'll be talking about tomorrow, but I guess I'll find out when I get there. So just uh, be on the lookout for that. I'll try to post a link tomorrow for those of you who are around in the morning, or I guess for a lot of you to be in the afternoon or evening or whatever, because. Some of you guys live in other places. So anyway, 1944. The year of, I guess, would you call it the year of decision? or do you, What do you think was kind of the decisive moment where Germany was more or less in a an unwinnable position? Uh, 1942. Uh, the <clears throat> logistical strain of the Eastern Front, uh, the fact they had not captured uh, Moscow or dealt a death blow to the Soviet Union, they can't replace their men in terms of quality and even in some ways numerically in 1942, which means that means they have to launch a more limited offensive. I think really crucially is that the Soviets make start making key uh, reforms in their military in 1942, such as limiting commissars, improvements to organization of tanks, and of course you have the Lend-Lease aid that's coming in as well. Um, yeah, so, you know, roughly 1942. 1942. You know what I'm saying? So that's that's probably what I would say is the point of, in many ways, of no return. What's What you're really dealing with here is uh, can the Germans essentially for lack of a better way, get a better peace deal, if you will. Like something like, uh, like in some ways, that's really what they're uh, essentially fighting for in 1944. Uh, now, some ways that's like very troubling. That's not entirely what I'm saying. In some ways there's trouble with that because in 1943, the Allies had declared unconditional surrender. Unconditional surrender had the positive, the main, one of the main reasons for it was to make sure that every party in the war felt the other party was in it for the entire long haul because there, you know, the, there's a fear of somebody maybe making a separate peace with the Germans. However, of course, there's the negative effect of only reinforcing the German uh, Germany's willingness to fight to the bitter end, especially when they know 
that the Soviets are most certainly going to do some pretty bad stuff in Germany when they get there, you know, out of revenge and also to fulfill certain um, uh, geopolitical uh, desires of Stalin. So the German army January 1944 finds itself, of course, in the defensive, fighting a war where there is no way they're going to get an armistice. There's not going to be a Treaty of Versailles in this case. It's essentially very sticking with Hitler. It's death or victory. Right. But yeah, I would say 1942 is when they're going to lose the war. They're not going to be able, Hitler's not going to be able to create this massive empire in the East. It, but what you have to fight 1943 to 45 is to determine the shape of Europe and what Germany's position will be in the shape of Europe. Anyway, what do you think? Um, in terms of when the war was officially, or when the outcome was pretty much inevitable, I would actually go with 1943. And the reason for that is, yes, in 1942, the failure to take Stalingrad was the last real chance they had to win a total victory. But I think in 1943, had the Germans done better, had they inflicted more losses, had they maybe uh, minimized Stalingrad losses a little more, done some things like that, it's possible they could have created a stalemate to where they'd be able to negotiate a peace. Maybe. I mean, I'm not sure exactly how it would work, but I still feel like uh, <laughs> them being completely destroyed was not necessarily an inevitability in 1943. They would also need... They would also have needed events in the Pacific to go more their way. And we can debate the degree to which Japan could win the war. Most people would say they didn't really have much of a chance, and I would mostly agree but Japan didn't have to necessarily start losing as fast as they did after those first six months of just, you know, success after success. They didn't have to be midway in Guadalcanal. Uh, and <clears throat> the, the fact that the Japanese do get stalled when they do also allows the Allies to put more resources into the European theater. That plays a big part, I think, as well. Uh, I guess what you're talking about in many ways is Kursk, right? them launching that limited offensive in Russia? Sort of. I mean, that was one of the ways in which they wasted their panzer reserves in an attack that you know, the Soviets were prepared for. And I think that was a lot of 1-1 one -one loss ratios. So that was really not what they needed to be doing. Um, they either needed to attack where they had some surprise, or they needed to just let the Soviets come at them and then use their tactical advantages to try to counterattack strategically and really whittle down these armies. Which, you know, that had really worked for them in Operation Mars and the Third Battle of Kharkov. Uh, and that was... I, 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 I know that several German generals did recommend that. I think Guderian was one of them. Um, and, I mean, could they still win the Eastern Front? No, but you don't necessarily have to suffer the horrendous losses that they're going to suffer in the East. Uh, but I, th I think in that regard, Kursk is very important for s beating up the war's ending. That and Italy being knocked out when they are as quick as they are. And then having that front opened up there as well. Uh, the Germans came very close to winning at Salerno. But in the end, they didn't. But a victory there would have been pretty crucial. Yeah, although I think, aside from the Salerno landing, most of what happened in Italy went pretty ideally for the Germans, given that fascist Italy collapsed. Uh, yes, um, it's one of their better done operations in that regard. Another thing, the thing about Italy, though, is there's all these, these debates about, uh, you know, who really got... Who, 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 who really had success in Italy, if you will? Was it, was it a waste for us? Was it really a drain on the German, German manpower? There's good arguments made in both cases. I kind of view the Italian campaign as it depends on the moment. So when we first land, it's bad for the Germans because they, they have to take forces out of Russia. And the Germans also committed a fairly large number of elite formations to Italy. Volschenjäger, Panzergrenadiers. Uh, at, at, at the same time... <laughs> we suffer absolutely horrible losses. It takes us d damn well forever to get up the boot. And you could say it's a major drain on uh, U.S. resources, uh, on Allied resources. Also, the Allies, whenever they were on the verge of a big victory in Italy, such as after Anzio and Monte Cassino or in the Po River Valley in late 1944, 
they would then would say, oh, well, you know, we need to send troops to Greece, or we're going to invade southern France, which I'm not saying those are necessarily bad decisions, but it always meant that the Italian campaign, when the when the Allies were on the verge of a great victory, it could be robbed, the reserve, vital reserves would be taken away from them. Yeah, I mean, the Italian armies, well, the Allied Italian armies, I guess I should say, were never all that well supplied. I mean, if you look at the Anzio landings, I want to say that the density of transport craft per uh, unit was much, much lower than at Normandy, to the point where I think it's maybe they had one fourth to one fifth of the transportation capacity in the initial landing in relative terms. Not, it, it, I mean, obviously, we get absolute terms way less, but even in relative terms, we're talking about a fourth yeah. or a fifth. So it took a lot longer for the men to get on the beach, get all their shit off, and start marching. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so. What I'd like to do is give an overall uh, strategic appraisal of uh, Germany's situation on all three fronts in January of 1944, as well as talking a bit about the air and naval, although we're not going to talk about that too much, but I'll mention those. And then we'll kind of like take a tour, if you will, going, you know, from probably from Italian front to Eastern front to Western front, and then circle right back again as we uh, go from 1944 into 45. Sounds good. All right. So, uh, overall, what has happened by January 1944 uh, is the Germans have suffered have taken uh, have suffered significant losses in territory. And keep in mind, this is an empire that, at its height, went all the way from Nord Cap in Norway, the Sahara Desert to the Pyrenees Mountains and the Volga, and that would be in late 1942. By now, of course, they're out of the Sahara. The Volga is a distant memory. Now, after Kursk, the Soviets launched their own counteroffensive into Ukraine. Throughout the fall of 1943, the Soviets do not envelop another German, another significant German force such as the Stalingrad, which is why that part of the campaign is sometimes not really as, as talked about as much because there wasn't some dramatic German reverse, but just a series of continuing defeats as the Soviets pressed through Ukraine eventually uh, crossing the Dnieper, the Dnieper River and taking Kiev. So the Eastern Front, the Germans have lost a lot of territory in Ukraine. This has created what was known as the Belarusian Balcony, which is near Minsk and not too far from Smolensk. That's where Army Group Center is. Army Group North is still on the outskirts of Leningrad. Now, the siege of Leningrad has long been over by this time. But the Germans are still, I mean, a, a true siege where, you know, you can't get supplies in except through rickety means. But there's still Germans right outside the city, shelling the city as well. In Italy, the Italian government is out of the war. There are actually, there are no major Italian forces at this point fighting on either side. Although eventually some will be mobilized for both sides. But at this point, not really. That's always made the Italian campaign goofy, you know, like... Um, a campaign where in Italy where the Italians aren't as involved as you think they would be. They yeah, almost irrelevant, uh, anyway, really. I mean, the Italians were to the hmm. Italian campaign. In some ways, yeah. <clears throat> Eventually, Mussolini is able to raise a few divisions, and and uh, uh, one or two of those divisions are actually very good. Well, like I said, the 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 Italian army at this time is a mix of conscripts and hardcore fascists. So anyway. Um, in Italy, though, uh, December 1943, Montgomery launches his last major offensive in Italy, uh, attempt to take the seize the port, city of Ortona, and eventually outflank Rome. That offensive fails. Ortona is taken by the Canadians, but heavy losses, and Ortona itself is under artillery bombardment, so it can't be used as an effective port. So in Italy, they are below Rome along what was known as the... It was the Gustav line was there? I believe um, so, yeah. But anyway, it was, yeah, very rugged terrain, strong defensive positions. And this is about halfway up the boot of Italy. And, of course, in France, the Germans are now building up major forces for the anticipated invasion of Normandy. The German forces in France are a weird mix of third-rate static defense units, many of which are filled with foreigners, uh, like Russians, for instance, and then elite panzer formations like, you know, 1st and 2nd SS Panzer, 9th and 11th Panzer Division, 
but also units that are now being thrown together, like the 116th Panzer Division, uh, 17th SS Panzer Grenadier. I mean, these are units that are uh, uh, that are being clobbered together to create mobile reserves for France. Uh, at the same time, of course, these German soldiers, what an interesting thing about them, the German soldiers are being used constantly to build up fortifications, which actually means a lot of those second and third rate troops are actually not being propped, are not, their training is not being brought up to snuff either. Yeah, I think, was it Rommel so have some was against doing more training is for more fortification? Yes. Rommel, yeah, Rommel believed that, of course, they had to destroy them at the beach. You know, we'll get to that when we get to the Western Front with the details on that. Uh, in terms of the air war, the bombing the bombing ramped up in 1943, but now it's really ramping up. The Luftwaffe at this point is undergoing a massive expansion of its forces. The Luftwaffe of early 1944 is the biggest, is the most aircraft they're ever going to uh, to field. And this is for anticipation that the bombing in 1944 will be even worse, and that they need to counter them with aircraft. Meanwhile, in the Atlantic. Things are going very poorly for the Germans. Early 1943 had seen some stunning successes with the U-boats, but then all of a sudden, allied technological and tactical uh, changes meant the U-boats start suffering heavy losses. A lot of that is due to aircraft in particular. Uh, you know, Donitz didn't really know. He, he, should, he should have suspected, though, but he didn't really know that they were reading his, his messages. So when his U-boats are out there, they're constantly being attacked by aircraft because they actually know where they're going. Uh, in an effort to keep the campaign going, Donitz shifted a lot of the U-boats to the South Atlantic. With the idea being that <coughs> the Allies had fewer aircraft, fewer bases, they could take out more shipping. Of course, the South Atlantic is also a lesser theater, and it puts more logistical strain on you. The U-boats have some have a bit more success in the South Atlantic than elsewhere, but it's still not enough, really. Yeah, I read a stat... Uh, before tonight, mm -hmm. and um, they were comparing the first five months in 1942 with the first five months in 1944. So, in early 1942, the Germans were sinking an average of something like almost 40 ships a month for the first five months. You get to 1944, yeah. there's not a month in the first five months where they get above 10. I think their best month is when they get up to 8. So, I mean, the number of ships they're sinking yeah. has declined precipitously at a time when the Allies are, have way more ships on the water bringing over men and supplies. Yeah, this of course allows that buildup in Europe to speed up even more. Um, Donitz was also hoping for certain technological things to work out for him. And one of the ones in 1943 was actually torpedoes that would kind of like, they would they were homing torpedoes, they home in for um, propellers. Which meant, were very, which meant for a brief period of time, the U-boats actually had a little bit of success, including sinking escorts. Uh, the Allies quickly figured out how to counter that, though. Uh, what they would do is the boat would drag behind them something that made an even louder noise that would make the torpedo home in on that instead. Uh, and at this point, though, Donitz, what he's really hoping for is the new U-boats that are being tested in the Baltic. U-boats uh, that are very quiet and are pretty fast underwater. Very advanced warships. So they're hoping that, um, Donitz is hoping that that is going to be the wonder weapon to win the war, and Hitler's going to put a lot of faith in that. It's probably also worth, uh, at this point, of course, mentioning uh, what is Hitler's position right now in Germany, uh, particularly in relation to uh, the various commands. The Luftwaffe, of course, is debatably the most, outside the SS, <laughs> is debatably the most nazi fi of the branches it being a creation of the Nazi party, headed by Hitler's presumed heir, Hermann Goering. Uh, the Navy at this point is headed by uh, Admiral Karl Donitz. Donitz is not a... Um, how do I say this? Like, He's very, very loyal to Hitler, and he follows his orders. And he actually had the nickname in the Navy, Nazi boy Donitz. And Donitz also saw that as the U-boat losses piled up, one of the, one one way to one of the ways to get the German Navy to still have commanders willing to go out in the Atlantic and fight was to increasingly crew U-boats with um, Nazi fanatics and uh, party party members. So you are you are seeing, especially in the U-boat arm, a move towards real Nazification. Um, 
At the same time, I, I, I don't know enough about Donis to say if his loyalty to Hitler is simply like, hey, this guy gets me money for my U-boats, and he's, he's allowed a lot of expansion of that. And he's also the man who supported me becoming commander in the Navy, and to the degree to which he also is a true believer. So I can't say whether he's not a true believer or just an opportunist. Uh, of course, you have the uh, SS this time is rapidly expanding. So keep in mind, the SS in 1939 as a, as a, as a military organization was very small and didn't do particularly well in Poland either. And there was a lot of antagonism against the SS in the, from the army. <coughs> but the SS <coughs> units did better, did pretty well, did well in Greece, and they did particularly well in the Eastern Front. And then especially the Third Battle of Kharkov. So following that, Himmler is able to expand the SS greatly. So at this time, the SS... Does, it has something I want to say like five or six panzer divisions. And as, the, as 1944 goes to 1945, they're going to raise even more divisions. So you have an SS that is rapidly expanding. In terms of the army, Hitler is head of the army because he, uh, he had done that in December 1941, fired Bronstich. He... His relationship with his commanders at this point is one of uh, mutual suspicion and dis distrust and dislike, for the most part. So a variety of officers Hitler is actually getting rid of, more in favor of officers who are more loyal to him, as we'll see as events unfold. Uh, <clears throat> should also be noted that his interference with uh, military decisions is only increasing. Um, his chief of staff at this time is Kurt Zeitzler. Uh, Kurt Zeitzler is a is a Nazi true believer. He is also a very very capable staff officer, very good. But he increasingly knows the war is lost. His nerves are on edge, and eventually he's going to have a nervous breakdown and have to be replaced. Yes, I remember him um, from our uh, tier list. Yeah, yeah. The last one to mention too is OKW because you know Hitler believed in a divide and rule thing, so. You know, the lines in the Third Reich are all over the place. It's, it's a bureaucratic nightmare, but that's, it's made that way, of course. In the case of the German military, ostensibly, you have, of course, the commands for the Luftwaffe, the Army, and the Navy. In the case of the uh, Army, it's OKH, which is Eitler's head of. Then you have OKW, which was created before the war, which is supposed to function as a kind of command, a combined uh, chiefs of staff in a way to coordinate between Luftwaffe, Navy, and Army. The OKW's first major test was they oversaw the invasion of Norway. By this time, what they really have is the OKW is... Um, the OKW is overseeing Norway, France, and Italy. OKH is overseeing the Eastern Front because the Luftwaffe, but especially the Navy, doesn't have much effect there. So you actually have a divided command. Should also be noted that OKW is essentially filled with Hitler toadies, that being Wilhelm Keitel and Yodel. Uh, Keitel was repeatedly, apparently many people called him a drill sergeant in a field marshal's uniform. I believe Göring coined that insult. <laughs> and there was one time where an officer was with uh, Franz Halder, who used to be head of OKH, and they're, they're walking by Keitel and he forgets to, he doesn't, he forgets to salute him. And he tells, like, uh, Halder, he's like, oh, God, I forgot to salute Keitel. And he says, Halder says, oh, don't worry, it's just Keitel. <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course, though, I imagine because a lot of those, those stories probably come from um, Halder, who, of course, after the war, pretended that he was a hardcore anti-Nazi. Yeah, when really he was, like, the most diet version imaginable. You yeah, you're that, or he um, was just too scared to ever say anything, and all all of these great witticisms were all entirely in his head. No, he could be difficult, though. You know, he definitely, uh, him and Hitler always had a contentious relationship, for what I read. I yeah, remember, I know he was right. hard on subordinates anyway. when he was chief of staff, because apparently he was not one to yeah. brook much disagreement, so he butted heads pretty hard with Guderian and a few others. Rommel really didn't like Rommel. I don't we'll think he liked von Manstein minute, though, either. Probably not. Although, although in the case of Rommel and Guderian, they were notoriously hard to work with. Um, but anyway, um, uh, the OKW, you have Alfred Yodel. He's kind of like the smarter of the two, although not by terribly too much. But 
uh, as, as we'll see with this, but, uh, but Kaido is just a rubber stamp, really. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's the overall situation. Ger oh, the German economy is really ramping up for total war at this point. 1944 is the height of their production capacity, even as they're being bombed. Yeah, apparently, so, you uh, got any uh, questions or observations? Oh, one thing I read earlier today that I guess I had never known is that um, it was sort of taken as a fact by the German officers at the time that what had cost the Kaiser's throne was fighting a two-front war. So when Hitler invaded Russia, there were a lot of officers who said, well, however the war turns out, Hitler is done. Wow, okay. <laughs> I do know there had been... Um, I do know there had been... Uh, a lot of ones were confident that they would crush the Russians just because they're poor showing the, the Winter War and because of what they had done in France, of course. But naturally, there were a number of them who uh, who thought it was um, a foolish prospect. One thing that's very important to understand with the German army at this time, too, and this, this also influences the Navy, is both of them are terrified of repeating 1918. In the case of the army, that is the idea of the stab in the back myth. And that maybe if we had held out, we could have kept fighting and winning. Even though it was the German generals who forced the Kaiser out and forced peace, when you really think about it. And, you know, even, even, if, even if some of the Germans hold out in 1918, I mean, that's not going to prevent Bulgaria, the Ottoman Empire, or Austria-Hungary from collapsing. Right? True. I mean, those countries were already finished. Yeah. Correct. And the other, the other hand, too, is the Navy felt disgraced because it was the mutiny of Navy sailors in 1918 that was crucial to the German Revolution of that year and the end of the war. So Eric Rader, who was commander of the Navy before Donitz, was absolutely obsessed with making sure that that would never happen again. Lots of measures, both political, morale, and other things were taken to ensure that that would never, ever happen. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so that's the, um, that's got, that's one of the other things that's influencing the, like, we're going to go fight to the death thing that's going to happen here. Right. Um, so would you, uh, like to start, would you like me to start with Italy? Sure. All right. Quick swig of water here. So Italy, you have, of course, the commander here is Albert Kesselring. Uh, a Luftwaffe commander, but one who's good at working uh, combined arms, known as Smiling Albert for his optimism. Uh, this is definitely this is one of the few command decisions Hitler made that most historians say is a good one. Is he just understood that Kesselring's optimism, was, as, as Hitler said, um, you know, the, the first ingredient to success is going to be some kind of optimism. He didn't want Rommel in charge there because Rommel was very gloomy about the prospect of holding on to Italy. Uh, Kesselring's defenses are, are based around the, uh, the Gustav line. This leads, of course, to a series of meat grinder battles at Monte Cassino. The Germans handle these battles very, very well for, for months. It's one of their high points in 1944. And of course, helps the troops defending the position. A lot of them are Fulschenjäger, which is you know, some of the most elite units in the whole world at this time. Yeah, the German paratroopers. The Allies an attempt to get... Yeah, German paratroopers. I just like saying Fulschenjäger. It just sounds cool. <laughs> it does. It also, so anyways, because of Jägermeister, it kind of sounds like it might be a drink. I can see that. <laughs> the new so, Fulschenjäger at, uh, you know, Schmidt's Pub. <laughs> the Allies decide to land at Anzio and attempt to get around the uh, defenses there. The Anzio landings are plagued by a lot of problems. Honestly, not enough. Um, you know, they, they didn't land enough men. The commander they landed wasn't exactly the, the best <laughs> uh, to be sent in. Um, he also, I forget his name off the top of my head, but he, he also, the orders he was given were the, would you say Lucas? Yeah, Lucas. Yeah. The orders he was, he was given were also not exactly the kind to make you go for broke. Although to be fair, I have read um, about the logistics involved here, and because of like a, like I was talking about earlier at Anzio, they had so few landing craft. 
for him to have advanced on a nearby town that was, I think, 10 miles away earlier, he would have had to have rushed in with just two divisions and launched a frontal attack with no flank support. Which, probably given the surprise that he had achieved, would have worked. But uh, it would have still been a somewhat foolhardy move, and it would have been hard to go much beyond that point, just because he would have been attacking and left his army open to attacks from the flanks. Not to mention there wouldn't be a second wave. There'd just be these two divisions hitting. If the Germans were to hold off that initial attack, then that'd pretty, pretty much be that. Yeah. There's a, that's a that that's a good point you made there. I mean, I uh, they they did like you're saying they didn't land with enough men really up front. Um, it's a terribly small landing considering what they're trying to do. Uh, the Germans contain it, and led by uh, Mackinson, who himself came from uh, one of the, one of one of Prussia's great military families, and he himself Mackinson was uh, was a was a good general too. Uh, solid general. He launches a series of attacks to the Anzio Beach. Uh, Hitler, in fact, rushes reserve units there. And these units are all over the place. Italians who have joined the SS, uh, members of an unformed SS division. You also had uh, some other Italian elite units that were thrown in from Mussolini's people. Uh, one of the heavy panzer battalions. And what was the other one? Uh, they, uh, oh, this, a unit called Lair, and it was one of the training units. It was actually one of Hitler's personally favorite training units gets thrown into. So they rush reinforcements down to Italy, launch a series of attacks. The attacks are ferocious. The Allies do suffer heavily, but the German attacks fail. They do not force them back. And what's interesting about Anzio is a lot of the officers actually were briefed, briefed Hitler, and essentially one of them said, like, you know, we, we we are not... The Allies now have built up a material superiority, and they've gotten a lot better at using that material superiority. Because keeping in mind, in, in North Africa, 1942 and 43, both the Americans and the British were still... Especially the Americans were having problems with coordination between arms, especially with aircraft. The Germans at Anzio noticed that, no, no, they're getting a lot better at this right now. And they told Hitler that, and Hitler said something the equivalent of, well, we got to see what some other battle, how the other battles go, because if I just agree with you right now that our attacks are no longer going to work, like you know Salerno almost worked, for instance, then we might as well just give up. I didn't realize that Hitler was that so, aware of how fucked things were. I thought he was more in denial than that. He gets more in denial later. You know, okay. we're still dealing with a semi-lucid Fuhrer at this point. <laughs> Okay. Um, but you know, no, I mean, like, like Anzio apparently, because there was a lot of analysis done since they had underperformed, I mean, they were expecting to toss these guys back in the ocean. Um, so there was a lot of nervousness over, um, I'm sorry, there was, there was a lot of fear over, <coughs> there was a lot of analyzation of the Anzio, the failure to crush them at Anzio, and some troubling conclusions were made, but once again, Hitler was like, oh, I can't think about it too much, guys. We've got to keep going. Uh, anyway, in the end, of course, the Battle of Monte Cassino is, is eventually won. The Allies actually, it's the I didn't know this, I was reading up on this, the Allies managed to shift over the bulk of their forces and launch a surprise attack that led to the fall of Monte Cassino. So it's actually an unsung success of the Italian campaign. Uh, controversially, of course, Clark ordered them to go for Rome instead of trying to block the Germans. I have read an argument recently that they probably couldn't have blocked the Germans because they couldn't have gotten enough men there to begin with. But I'm still inclined to think that, no, nah, they really should have tried anyway. I mean, you don't know what you could achieve, and you could, you could of course, inflict even heavier losses. And not that Rome had no strategic importance. It definitely did have strategic and propaganda use. So I'm not saying going for Rome is like a complete blunder, but Mark Clark's decision to go for Rome, I think might be a little less how stupid than it's been portrayed, or at least over the door, you know, foolish. The Allies then chase the Germans north towards the Gothic line. 
They are going to traverse almost almost 300 miles of terrain in only a few months. Uh, while they don't manage to trap any significant German forces, they do inflict heavy casualties at that phase of the campaign and make significant gains in territory. But then, the uh, Harold Alexander, the theater commander, they take away uh, several of his divisions for Operation Dragoon, which is the planned landing in southern France. Uh, this also includes the uh, French forces, which were, which one analysis considers them actually the best troops that they had at their disposal. Certainly, they had very experienced mountain fighters, which is very useful in Italy. But they are shift over, shifted over for operations in France, which is what I'm going to talk about next. So, you got any uh, thoughts on the Italian campaign at that point? No, I mean. On Clark's capture of Rome, I can understand to a certain extent why he was eager just to go grab Rome rather than having to fight more since the battles up to that point had gone very badly for his troops. I mean, the British had also had a rough time of it, but the Americans in Italy really did poorly in pretty much every battle up to that point. They basically yes. gained nothing every time that. they attacked. Yeah, losses had been high, um, a lot of a lot of mistakes made, and yeah, that, that's why in the end, I'm 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 one of those people who doesn't think the Italian campaign was a waste, because I do think they learned valuable experience they're going to need in France. I know one one guy one time said that that's a really expensive uh, training exercise there, but I, I thought, but wait, no, no, the Italian campaign is taking troops away from other German theaters, and it did knock Italy out of the war at a point when Mussolini is weak. Yeah, and that, that was a front the so, Allies could afford to fight that the Germans could not. And also, once the Germans are rolled back, this also allows the U.S. to put the 15th Air Force in Italy, and then they bomb the absolute shit out of southern Germany. <coughs> That's the one that yeah. had all the B-24 Liberators, the one that George McGovern was in. Yeah, and that's also the uh, setting for the uh, novel uh, 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 Catch-22 which uh, they had a good film adaptation of that in the 19, in 1970. I think it was the director of uh, The Graduate. And I think they just recently did a TV show based on it or another movie. Okay, I, I, I'm not familiar with the adaptations. I've only... That was a novel I was reading. Yeah, I got it out of the library and I lost it when I was halfway through. So then I had to pay the replacement oh, fee of like 140 bucks. That sucked. It was oh pretty God, good, though, terrible. what parts right. of it I did read. But anyway. Yeah, I should definitely read that one. So, <clears throat> do you want me to uh, shift over to France now? Sure. Uh, let's go get some baguettes. <coughs> <laughs> Welcome to one of the most uh, confusing and fucked command situations of the Second World War. So, France, you actually have, like, four layers of command. You have Adolf Hitler himself. Then you have underneath him OKW with Keitel and Yodel. Then underneath them is Rundstedt, who is commander of the Western Front. He's the only, I think he's the only German general I know in the war who is commander of two army groups, essentially. And then below him, of course, are army groups B and G. B is Rommel's. That's the one that covers Normandy, Brittany, and Pas de Calais, and the Netherlands. Army group G covers southern France and the um, western coast near Bordeaux. Army Group G is by far the weakest German army group of any. I think it only has assigned to it maybe two, I think like three Panzer divisions, although I think 2nd SS was, was I, I forget why 2nd second, second SS was in southern France, and I, but I don't know if they were actually attached to Army Group G, but I know they had two Panzer divisions. That was pretty much it. I think Army Group uh, so G is very probably weak. still stronger than, uh, was it Army Group F that won in the Balkans? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. There. Well, Army Group F is practically not even Army Group. You know? yeah, I feel like they just had an like, extra field that. marshal spot, and they're just like, eh, fuck it, we'll uh, park some asshole here. Yeah, I, I think I think, um, I think those Army Groups that were down in the Balkans are just more like armies. I think they call them Army I think the reason they called them Army Groups is because I think that also they had another command the Bulgarians because the Bulgarians were involved in anti-partisan stuff in Greece and Yugoslavia. So I think that's why they were called an army group, even though a lot of their personnel are not German. 
Um, but yeah, that makes sense. But yeah, yeah. So Army, of, of, Army Group G is pretty weak, though. But also, an invasion of southern France is not wholly expected. I mean, it does occur, of course. But anyway, Army Group B is where the meat is. But it's not just Army Group B. There's also Panzer Command West as well, which would later on become the 5th Panzer Army. So we got a confusing situation here. And Rommel and Rundstedt really cannot agree on what to do. Now, a review of these Army Group commanders, by the way. Uh, Army Group G is commanded by Johannes Blaskowitz. You know about, much about him? No. Uh, fascinating German general. Uh, he, was, he was considered one of their best commanders, so he played a major role in the occupation of Czechoslovakia and then Poland. He vocally complained about atrocities in Poland, especially SS atrocities. The guy hated the SS. And for that reason, he was eventually fired, and he was not promoted to field marshal, and everybody else of his rank was after the fall of France. Um, so, so he was... Um, he very much was one of those German generals who's, uh, who really is actually trying to avoid atrocities and tries to do that in France as well. Uh, after the war, actually, he was arrested and was going to be tried for war crimes... Apparently, his defense, though, said, yeah, you're, probably, you're probably getting acquitted. We're not even sure why they're accusing you. And then he died, supposedly in a suicide. But I just read recently that apparently some of the people in the prison said it was actually members of the SS who wanted to kill him, to silence him. Damn. Don't know what the case is. I've only just found out about this today. I want to read more. But anyway, he's in command in the South. Command in the North, of course, is Erwin Rommel. Uh... Erwin Rommel is, uh, of course, they had the whole myth of the Desert Fox, if you will. I, well, I say myth, though. I mean, he was a very, very capable commander. Uh, but a few notes on Rommel that explains one of the reasons why he has a lot of problems with people. Rommel does not come from the German military very, very much in class. He did not excel in school, even in a training academy, except in leadership qualities. But he, of course, won the Blue Max, the Pour les Marie. In the Italian campaign, as did another general we'll talk about a little later. And <clears throat> he managed to find himself near Hitler in command of one of Hitler's uh, uh, personal guards. And uh, Hitler liked the guy. And he, Hitler generally was wary of a lot of those old Prussian types. As you'll see, he's increasingly favoring guys like Rommel, Modell, and Schoner as the war goes on. Anyway... That allows Rommel to get command of 7th Panzer Division, which he leads very well in France, and then eventually command an Africa Corps, a very daring commander who would oftentimes go to the front. He was also very exceedingly difficult and, and certain that he was correct. At the same time, a lot of uh, German generals, especially those of the Prussian aristocracy, did not like him or trust him. Many saw him as a person who owed his rank complete more, less to his skill and more just to uh, having Hitler's favor. And of course, he later on became... Uh, very popular in German propaganda. Her, uh, uh, Goebbels loved him. Uh, so there was a lot of resentment against Rommel because he was popular, he was played up in the press, he wasn't a German aristocrat, he was difficult. That should be emphasized. He got into a lot of arguments with a lot of different officers throughout his career. Very willful man. Well, it's interesting. I, I've watched this. I mean, I don't really know German well enough to follow along with what he's saying, but I've seen the propaganda films, or at least the little bits of them with Rommel in them. I can see why they wanted him there, because he was a very good speaker. Yes. Uh, Remember, the only thing that he'd excelled at in officer school was leadership. Yeah, I mean, he also just looks the part, I guess, you know, to use that phrase that's come into oh, yeah. uh, vogue lately, straight out of central casting, because he actually looks like a, you know, fairly hard guy. He also didn't look as rough or as... Uh, dumpy as a lot of these other guys because a lot of these other guys showed their age a lot more or they were bald or whatever but Rommel looked fairly tough yes and you know Hitler's ideas on class and class relations are uh, something I'd like to read up more about but I also generally get the feeling too they really wanted to play up look this is a German from I want to say humble origins but you know normal origins if you will not like uh you know, that's some Prussian aristocrat who's like, ah, my family's been fighting since 1200. <laughs> exactly, yeah. No, he's, I think he's, um, he's from the area of Swabia, which 
whereas almost all <laughs> yeah. Vaughns are all from the east, so they're all from a fairly small geographic area. So you also represent southern Germany. This is also an aside about Guderian as well. Guderian came from Prussia, but he did not come from Prussian military aristocracy, although his family was well off. He also was not a Prussian Junker, which may have also led to certain amounts of tension. Uh, Rommel was not a theorist of any type, but he was an aggressive and effective commander who very quickly understood uh, the capabilities of tanks. In fact, when Hitler straight up says after the fall, after Poland falls, Rommel's like, I want to command. And Hitler says, name it and you're, it's yours. Rommel says, Panzer Division. And keep in mind, he's the only Panzer Division commander in France who did not fight in Poland and was not associated with, and was, I believe, the only one not associated with the um, the Panzer Pioneers, if you will, the uh, the guys like Guderian, and a lot of names are going to come up in this talk, like Harp is another one. Well, it's interesting you say <clears> that, Daring, because actually the main Heart. Panzer commander in France, as we discussed back when we did the German generals, was von Kleist, who had actually almost been borderline antagonistic against the tank school, but then once he became oh, yeah, a commander of Panzers, von, he was all in and did really well. And von, von, von Manstein was what he mentioned. He came up with the plan, and von Manstein favored assault guns over Panzers before the war. I just meant that the division commanders are almost all... And, and division and corps commanders are almost all part of that theorist group, if you, you know. That's what I'm saying. Like, but you're right, Kleist was put above them. I kind of saw that also as a way of the non-Panzer people being like, okay, we're going to put somebody with you who isn't totally of your side. Well, what was funny, though, is that right. at a certain point in the French campaign, Guderian sort of lost his nerve a little bit, and he said, yeah, maybe we should rest a bit before we drive on, and Kleist said, no, for this to work, we have to keep fucking going. Yeah. So actually, it, ironically, it ended up working out exactly the opposite of probably how anybody drew it up. <laughs> well, Rommel and Rundstedt, they don't act, they don't have the most antagonistic relationship, but they don't get along. Like, uh, there are definitely officers Rommel hated way more than Rundstedt. I don't think Rommel even hated Rundstedt. He just thought he was wrong. Yeah. Uh, Rundstedt uh, said that they should wait for the Allies to land and then launch an attack. Uh, when they could gather their forces, Rommel said, no, 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 their material superiority, especially in aircraft, uh, makes it to where you need to destroy them at the beach as soon as possible. Uh, Rommel actually said, by the way, Rommel said this about air superiority. He said, fighting on air superiority, he says, the equivalent of trying to fight men armed with guns, with trying to use spears against machine guns. So Rommel's definitely big on the whole, like, if you don't have air superiority, you're going to lose. He had seen that in North Africa, though. The Luftwaffe didn't have air superiority, but they, they were advantaged all the way into El Alamein. And he saw what the, uh, what the British aircraft did to him in that battle. So at any rate, uh, there's all this debate in the German generals about where the Allies are going to land. The most likely landing spot, they believe, is Pas de Calais, because it's closest to the Ruhr area. Uh, some people suspected Normandy. In fact, Hitler suspected Normandy for a period of time. And we, we talked a lot about this in our uh, Normandy stream, but the Allies land. They, um, they suffer 50% fewer losses than they expected. The beaches are secured. The Germans rush forces in there. The actual fighting in Normandy is absolutely ferocious, and it's one of the German armies last great hurrahs of the war is their ability to not only contain the beachhead for as long as they do, but to inflict very heavy losses. Uh, the way the Normandy terrain is, it actually plays into Germany's advantage. Because that's something to keep in mind with the German army this time, too. Starting in 1943, they began reducing training times. Now, 1944, this is still an experienced, very capable army, but it's just not as well trained anymore, especially on the Western Front, as we mentioned, with them building fortifications. But it still is the best army in Europe in terms of small unit tactics. So the train in Normandy is playing to the, one of the few advantages the Germans still have. Hence why it takes forever to break out. Rommel, being Rommel, spent a lot of time near the front discussing matters with officers and the men. He did send a candid report to Hitler where he said the men are fighting heroically, and hard, but it's only a matter of time before there's a breakout. 
And of course, eventually both Rommel and Rundstedt spoke to Hitler and said, this is effectively, this is not going to work. They're going to eventually break out uh, France. <coughs> this, of course, eventually leads to Rundstedt being replaced with um, uh, von Kluge, <clears throat> uh, you know, clever Hans. Uh, do you have any notes on uh, the French campaign at this point? Not too many, no. I feel like we covered that before. Um, of course, the breakout was yeah. a long, brutal process. And a lot of it is that I think that where Montgomery landed, they were expecting to have their breakout there, at least the British were. So they took their armor up and ended up encountering the strongest of the German panzers right what it came which was, what, five miles inland? So that yeah. ended up being a long, protracted yes, battle. Yes, sure. Oh, yeah, Montgomery launches a series of offensives that fail to gain territory. They are inflicting heavy losses, though. But, yeah, they're going up against 1st and 12th SS Panzer, uh, 21st Panzer Division. The Allies fight Panzer Lair a lot, which Panzer Lair was formed from various training units. Once again, an emergency, kind of like the 116th Panzer Division. Like, we need mobile units in France. Quick, send the training units out there, which leads to it, which is, you know, that's not a great long-term thing because that means your actual training of Panzer troops, you've just lost the men who are veterans at actually training troops. Now, that creates an elite division at the front, but you can already see the problem, can't you? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Panzer Lair, when the breakout happens... The Allies' saturation bomb the position of Panzer Lair and just obliterate it. I want to say they'd already had to bail right out through. of their vehicles, though, because of a lack of gas, right? Or which division was that? I don't know about that. I just know Panzer Lair was blown apart by aircraft. Well, I know there was one division the Allies blew up, but pretty much all the crews had left hours or maybe even a couple of days before because they completely ran out of gas. It might have been Lair. It could have been one of the other <laughs> ones, though. I don't know. Um, no, I mean Lair. I mean they were they were in their defensive positions. They were just obliterated. Ah, uh, must have been another unit. Ran then. right through. Now the Germans did look. Hitler saw this and said, "Oh, we can launch an attack and cut them off." So that leads to the uh, counterattack at Mortain. Uh, the Germans overrun a few of the initial units, but the Allies pulverize them with artillery and aircraft and inflict heavy losses on them. Uh, as you said, the the British, while they were stopped from taking Khan quickly, they did keep the best German units pinned there and effectively just wore them down through attrition. And due to the both the fact that the Germans... The, Ger the German placement system at this time is totally messed up as well because of the bomb plot, because a lot of members of the bomb plot were part of the replacement army. And destruction of the uh, the uh, the infrastructure to actually get soldiers to Normandy meant replacements just did not come at enough of a clip to replace those losses. That's also worth mentioning too. This is the around the period of time when the Germans lose the air war. Um, the na early nineteen forty four bombing campaigns to the Allies. The Allies suffer heavy losses, but the Luftwaffe the Luftwaffe fighter force is almost obliterated by the summer of nineteen forty four. And when that's really it, when the uh, roar gets enough. Was it 1942 or 3 where Goering saw P-51s over uh, Berlin and he said, well, this war is over? I don't know who would have said that. I mean, maybe Goering did. As you know, at this point, he was, um, he was, he was seen less and less in the public spotlight. He was getting fatter. Doing a lot um, of drugs. <laughs> his relationship, you know, a lot of drugs. His relationship with Hitler was de deteriorating. Uh, this is around the, This is a period of time when Himmler is really the one who's coming in, and it looks like Himmler is going to be the one to succeed Hitler. Um, <coughs> you know, not the head of the Luftwaffe. So, yeah, he might have had that thought. I mean, Goering was definitely one of, if not the smartest of the top Nazis. So he, he you know, which doesn't mean he couldn't have fooled himself, but he probably he probably had a better inkling than some of the guys around him what was coming. Yeah, because I think the, the thought before they saw the P-51s that had the range to reach Berlin, they thought, oh, well, the thing is, we won't be able to defend a lot of our forward troops from bombers, but when they come deep into Germany, that's when we can really tear them up. So if we hold our fighters back a bit, we can wait till their fighter escorts can't get there and then do some damage. Once they see that the P-51s have that kind of range, 
they're like, oh, wait, we're fucked. Yeah. I want to say it's May 1944 is like when the Luftwaffe's back is broken. It sounds right. Uh, keep it in mind, throughout 19... Yeah. Keep in mind, throughout 1943, I mean, the Luftwaffe was still inflicting heavy losses on the Soviets, both on the ground and in the air. The Luftwaffe was doing pretty well in Italy, cons all things considered, and they had done surprisingly well in Tunisia and Sicily. Uh, but this is when the Luftwaffe starts to become a non-factor. Yeah, and a lot of it, too, or at least is... Like um, an I mean, if we think about both the Red Air Force on the one hand, the Allies on the other... Uh, just the amount of aircraft that the U.S. is producing alone, and also the quality of all the aircraft that the U.S. is producing. Um, so when you're trying to fight the Allied bombers, if you attack them near the coast, you have to deal mostly with P-47s or Spitfires. And then they're relieved in turn by fresh Mustang pilots as they go deeper. And then the Mustang pilots are relieved yeah. on the way back by another flight. That's how many fucking planes the U.S. had. It wasn't like the P-51 wanted to go the entire route. Every time the Germans attacked, they were not attacking weary guys who had had to fly the whole time on a boring escort mission. All the guys they were facing had just gotten there, more or less. So they were about as fresh, and they had equal, if not better, planes almost all scenarios. That definitely better maintained planes, uh, even if the capabilities were about similar. And also, the U.S. pilots by this point would have more training if they weren't veteran, if the unless the Luftwaffe guys were veterans. So, at this point, yeah. the air war was goddamn near impossible. Uh, not to mention, we have the um, the British attacking at night. The Germans had night fighters, but I think the British weren't too bothered by them. I mean, night fighters were cool and all, but and they had radar. Some of them were pretty advanced, but there weren't that many of them. They weren't that effective. On the Eastern Front, the Soviets were just throwing numbers at the Luftwaffe. I mean, the Sturmoviches were hard as hell to kill. They were basically flying tanks. And the, the Russian yeah. fighters had some flaws in them. Like, we mentioned that one of the major fighters thinks the Law 7 had an engine that had a tendency to catch on fire if you went at a certain altitude. That being said, despite its flaws, it was still a decent platform, and the Soviets had a lot of them. So basically... The Germans had the qualitative advantage in the East, but they were massively outnumbered, and eventually the numbers told, and the Luftwaffe was just beginning whittled to nothing. And as we mentioned before, as the Allied bombing intensifies, the Germans have to pull a bunch of planes off the Eastern Front to defend the homeland. Yeah. Yeah. Which means by the time you get to uh, summer of 1944, now the Red Air Force commands the air. Yeah. You know, whereas 43, it's kind of a give and take. Although, although the Russians have the advantage, the Germans can still inflict heavy losses a, on ground and air, but it's not really going to be the case when you get to the summer of, 40, um, of 44. Uh, interesting thing, though, of course, when, Hit, when Rommel and Rundstedt spoke with Hitler and essentially said, uh, I believe Rundstedt said, end the war, you bloody fools. Um, Hitler, of course, was painting all of his hopes on wonder weapons. So, you know, we got some fun ones here, right? You have the uh, the ME-262 uh, jet fighter, which is excellent. The Allies have a good counter for it. It's called blow it up on the runway. Yeah. Or um, the other way to deal, with, deal yeah. with it is if you have a heavy fighter like the P-47 Thunderbolt, you can actually catch it in a dive. Yeah, yeah. Um, but don't be wrong, though. The 262 is... The 262, though, is fearsome. They're giving it to great pilots. It's an excellent airplane. Uh, it's... It's an amazing piece of work. Yeah, and this is one of those examples um, where Hitler trying to be a tech nerd backfired. Because his initial idea is, wait, let's use this for ground attack, even though it was designed to be a fighter. And then all of his engineers said, that's a dumb idea, but they ended up doing it anyway. And then after several months, he realized, oh, wait, we should use this as a fighter. Yeah, that's what we've been telling you, dude. That's what it is. It's a fucking fighter. <laughs> I'd heard that story may not be exactly as you're saying it, but don't quote me on that one. I think there might be something else indifferent there too, but don't quote me on that one. I, something I want, I want to look up on that one though. The, of course, you had the V1, V2 rockets, which has to be said, um, the V1 and V2 rockets were um, they, they they did shock London considerably in England. So make no mistake about it, it has an effect on the domestic morale over there. And it inflicts quite a few losses, civilian losses. But this is not going to be enough, of course, to turn the tide. 
Okay, there's, of course, hoping that those new U-boats are going to come out. And they do start to come out in 1945. And they're really good. Very, very good. But they're not coming out fast enough. Yeah, okay. and I mean... And keep that, in mind, too, in desperation, Donitz ordered his U-boats in the Normandy area to ram Allied ships. Shit. Uh, also, with the uh, yeah, V-1s, I was like, the yeah. V-1s, although they were fast, they only flew... I don't know, 600 miles an hour, whatever it was, but they flew in straight lines, so if you had a high-powered fighter like the, was it, it wasn't Typhoon, it was the Tempest, which is like a souped-up Typhoon, um, and they would use those yeah. as interceptors to deal with V1s, and those were actually fairly effective at shooting down V1s. Now, V2s were too fast to shoot down, but there weren't that many of them. Yeah. <laughs> another one too other wonder weapons would be the uh the heavy tanks coming in like you know jag tiger jag panther assault guns uh the tiger tank has already been introduced and i get the king tiger they're working on which is an amazing piece of work too um the germans also uh, they had these the tiger tank battalions they would set up these units uh tend to be elite uh made them would inflate i think one of them i think it was the 502nd in its career lost 100 tanks but inflicted 1700 tank losses estimated god damn um, you know a well placed heavy tank battalion could could cause massive losses in blunt major offensives yeah, One so most it's a good thing you mentioned well placed because uh, the big downside to those German super tanks is that they were extremely unreliable mechanically and tended to break down a lot yeah Exactly. I mean, if you caught them in a bad situation, get blown to pieces. And one or two of those battalions had very poor records. Uh, one of the ones sent to Italy uh, just it got. <laughs> one of the ones sent to Italy lost most of its tanks due to mechanical failure and didn't inflict that many losses anyway. Um, but generally speaking, uh, uh, the, the battalions overall, I think, were very effective. I, I think we kind of like. The, I mean, the Tiger and the King Tiger had a lot of problems. I think it's always worth pointing that out. But at the same time. In the right situation, those things were like kings of a battlefield. In the right situation, yeah. No, when they would run, they would be pretty fucking cool. I honestly still think the Panther <laughs> was a better tank than the Tiger, though, just because of its mobility. That was a uh, Guderian's opinion. So, I think they were right to make the Tiger tank and the Tiger two, and then you concentrate those in these 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 elite battalions. I think that was a good idea. Guderian was the big advocate of the Panther. And his whole plan, when he was head of inspector of the Panzer forces in 43 and 44, was to make sure that every Panzer division had a battalion of Mark IVs and a battalion of Panthers, which they essentially have by autumn of, autumn of 1944, which has a big effect. It does have a considerable effect on the way the campaigns go in the autumn of 44. Huh. Uh, another super weapons that are being waited on, of course. You got other types of airplanes. You got other types of jet aircraft. Uh, you get that one. There's that one airplane that has like propellers on both sides. Yeah, I've seen the, that one before. The Dornier 335 or something like that. Yeah, and you have Goliath, the, which is a uh, remote comet. Yeah, you have the Goliath, which was a uh, remote controlled ex remote controlled uh, uh, bomb they used to blow up tanks. Uh, the Panzerfaust has already been introduced. Now you've got the Panzer Schreck, which is even more accurate. You have that one assault rifle that's going to be the uh, progenitor of the AK-47. So yeah, the, uh, the Germans are... Oh, oh, by the way, late war, late war, some late war Panthers have infrared. Yeah, also, the uh, STG-44 was actually not the precursor for the AK-47. Uh, the AK-47 internally was completely different. The STG was much more really? complex. But, I mean, if you look at it out and okay. externally, it does look like it. But it actually, they're not that closely related. Although I imagine that it did inspire it a little bit. But the AK design is much, much streamlined. Whereas the Germans and typical oh, German yeah, fashion no, I, made no. it very complicated. Yeah, that's an over-engineering thing with Germans. One of the only pieces of equipment, by the way, that they fielded that wasn't over-engineered was their U-boats. Their U-boats tend to be pretty streamlined engineering. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Um yeah, but no, like German battleships, no, over-engineered. Tanks, over-engineered. No, I just, that, I, that that weapon, though, is the first assault rifle, to my knowledge. 
Like submachine gun's a different thing. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it yeah, technically does qualify as the first assault rifle. I'm not a big gun expert, but uh, I'm pretty sure you're right. Yeah, me neither. But the Germans are... Um, uh, the Germans... I mean, they're great engineers. So they're fielding an army with like superb equipment, particularly at this time of the war. And Hitler, Hitler was a tech nerd. Um... You know, a lot of uh, a lot of people would even people who didn't like him would comment that he knew technical specifications very very well, and that had to also really appeal to him. Just all these gadgets and toys. That's how we're going to win the war through technology. There you go, everybody. Hitler's the first like uh, tech will save us guy. Yeah, no, that's true. I, uh apparently he also wanted to claim credit for the design of the Tiger, and I'm not sure how exactly involved he was, but he did see that as something that he had a heavy hand in. He was, you know, he was, I mean, he was involved in, like, designing it, but he was heavily, in, they were trying to impress him, and he was, that was a design process he was very interested in, that's for sure. Because I want to say he, maybe he mandated that uh, somebody figure out a tank that utilized the 88 or some shit like that. I don't know exactly how involved he was, but when, when they put it together, he's like, oh, it's my brainchild, my will created this wonder weapon. Yeah, and Hitler's all about that will, you know, the movie Triumph of the Will, right? So that's that's what he's all about. Um, so yeah, no, so the uh, so these are the things that Hitler is really hoping are going to win him the war it is going to be, uh, I would say, expanding the SS, the Nazification of the German officer corps, and wonder weapons, and of course a populace like willing to die. Is, of course um so so no the war is going to keep on going but that should take us to where to the eastern front where things are about to get really out of hand because the germans the eastern front have a major problem <laughs> in late 1943 hitler decided that the eastern front was no longer the theater of decision that was the western front his view not and not inaccurate was that in the Western Front a loss of territory was much worse because of how close it was to Germany. That one could, however, lose some territory in Russia and be okay. However, the the attempt to counter the Allies means that new Panzer divisions are being formed for France. Other Panzer divisions in the Eastern Front are being pulled out and sent to France, and this is after Kurt, the disaster at Kursk. So. The German army in 1944 has fewer panzers on the Eastern Front, just at a time when the Soviets have radios in their tanks, their tank tactics, but especially their operational use of tanks has vastly improved, and they are now being able to mass these tanks. And also massively the up arming their tanks. I mean, like, now they've got a lot of 85 yes. millimeter guns and all kinds of other stuff, uh, and not to mention their... Um, yeah, T-3045. Yeah. Massive, uh, massive assault guns. So, uh, and it, it, so he, the, the Eastern Front is being denuded of Panzer reserves at the exact moment when they most need them. But this is the but but you, but Hitler in a way is correct. In the West, a loss there would be a complete disaster. So shift your Panzer forces there. Now, in some ways, it turns out to not really work out because they're not able to even throw the Allies into the sea. Uh, you know, but anyway. So, on the Eastern Front, the first sign of distress happens in Ukraine. Uh, Konev launches an attack that manages to separate a German salient, and that leads to the Khorasan pocket. One of the reasons for the pocket, by the way, was that Manstein was away, and the, the, his chief of staff was in command at that moment, named Theodore Busse. And Busse was uh, very much a guy who followed orders. And so when they were saying, like, hey, we need to pull these men back as the Soviet attack begins, Bush says, like, nope, Hitler says not a step back. I'm following those orders. Um, Manstein, I mean, has strengths and weaknesses as a commander, but he would not have allowed a pocket to form. That I'm pretty, I'm pretty certain of that. So, but the pocket was shallow. 
so the Germans were able to do a breakout attempt and get, and a lot of them were able to escape the pocket. Although not according to Soviet histories, by the way. According to Soviet histories, it was like Stalingrad Part Two, oh, and not a German escaped. Pocket. Actually, that's one thing I yeah. read about earlier. Um, so it's interesting. Yeah, you're right. The difference in numbers. I think the Soviets claim about forty thousand kills, and the Germans claim maybe fifteen to twenty thousand at most. Yeah, and uh, what's also they interesting. Had to what? They had, they had to abandon their heavy equipment, but the soldiers get out. But anyway, sorry, go on, man. So uh, there's also an interesting war atrocity I read about. So, you know, a lot of the Germans, as they were retreating, were completely vulnerable. So the way that the, some of the Soviets dealt with them is they would use their tanks to chase them down and run them over. And if men on foot managed to evade the tanks, then Soviet cavalrymen would ride up and saber them. Yes, that was by orders of Konev, uh, who once again is Stalin's probably Stalin's most ruthless front commander. Yeah, up to that point, I actually didn't know that a lot of the major front commanders were authorizing atrocities. I thought that was something that just happened, and they just kind of shrugged their shoulders at it. I didn't know that they actually gave the green light to stuff like that. Yeah, once again, Konev in particular enjoyed this kind of thing. Uh, the only front commander I know who who seems to have tried to curb atrocities that I, I can say for certain was Roka, uh, Rokosovsky. Am I pronouncing his name right? Uh, Rokosovsky? Rokosovsky, yeah, Rokosovsky. Uh, there's evidence, of course, that he would try to curtail atrocities. Um, for instance, when the, when the Soviets invade Germany, he's like, I think he's the only one who actually gives orders for, now guys, no looting or raping, which happens anyway, right? Uh but apparently one of the reasons in Rokosovsky's uh, second Belarusian front that that occurs is a lot of Rokosovsky's junior officers said, I'm afraid of my own men. And if I'm going to stop them from having a good time, they may just shoot me and say, oh, you know, a sniper got them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so a lot of Germans get course on pocket. They lose their heavy equipment. Manstein shortly thereafter is removed. Um, Hitler says to Manstein, essentially, yeah, I'll bring you back when the time for great offensives comes, but now is the time for defense. And he's essentially saying, I don't think you're good at defense. Uh, this apparently led to one of Manstein's only um, outbursts against Hitler, although it was relatively mild, because he was always kind of a moral coward around the Fuhrer, which was doubly funny because before he'd go meet Hitler, he'd, he'd say things like, I'm going to tell that guy what's really happened, and then he, you know, he'd cower before him, essentially. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> but at any rate, though, the Soviet offensives through Ukraine culminate in a little-known battle called the Battle of Kovel, or Kovel, which involves the uh, 5th SS Panzer Division Viking. You know about this group? Um, not really, no. I've, I've heard of them before, but I don't know that much about them. So originally, the SS had five divisions of the Eastern Front. Uh, all five of them had good combat reputations eastern front but especially one two three and five and one is adolf hitler lifeguards two is das reich third is death's head uh token kopf and fifth is viking viking is the first ss unit that is made up of non-germans although they're nordic so it's like danes swedes norwegians right are allowed into that one hence the name viking uh, in a very, uh, the 5th SS uh, Panzer Division, the Battle of Koval is, I mean, the German tanks in the battle were literally getting off the train when they detrain and going straight into battle in some cases. Uh, the Soviet offensive in that area is blunted. And this caused a lot of nervousness in the German high command because the way Koval is positioned, they were afraid the Soviets were then going to lunge for the Baltic Ocean and thereby cut off Army Group North and Center. But the Russian offensive is blunted in that area. But the Germans are so terrified of a repeat of, of, the, of that very situation I named that they concentrate their limited panzer reserves in the Eastern Front in that area. Which means that army groups north and center are stripped of mobile formations. Which, of course, is going to lead into everybody's favorite op operation. What's that? What's that, Thersites? What's everybody's favorite operation? Operation Bagration. Or, or what'd your boy uh, say in the Stalin stream? Bagration or something? Bagration? 
I'm not sure. Uh, I, yeah, you mean Dries? Uh, well, he yeah, actually yeah. knows. He actually knows the Russian name. So, whatever he said. Do you know how many tanks Army Group Center has when they're attacked? Not very many. I know. That I, I don't even. I don't even know they had a dedicated division at that moment because of how many have been stripped away for other stuff. They had one Panzer division that I know of. I forget the number off the top of my head, but they did have one Panzer division. I'm going to see if I can find it real quick. Yeah, and also um, I remember... No, the, I mean, yeah. The other uh, fun fact about Army Group Center is that because Ernst Busch was a hardcore Nazi who believed in the Fuhrer, Hitler said not one step back. So when Bush's <laughs> different commanders would come to him and say, hey, we need to adjust our line so that way we don't have little pockets that the Russians can sneak into... He said, no, the Fuhrer said, no steps back. I'm not retreating a mile. I'm not retreating half a mile. That's not happening. That's unreasonable. So yeah. he actually could have made his line a little more sturdy and solid, given his troops a better chance to support each other, and only given up pretty minuscule amounts of ground to do so, stuff that Hitler probably wouldn't be that worried about, especially since this is a guy that Hitler trusts. So he would not accuse yeah. Bush of being a defeatist for saying, I need to adjust my line by a tiny bit. But Bush wouldn't even ask, because he said, no, I'm going to follow those orders to the letter. Damn the consequences. Now, one minor defense of Ernst Bush, <laughs> this is very minor, he and his front commanders did perceive that an offensive was coming. Uh, there's some evidence that the idea of Soviet deception efforts are sometimes overstated, in World War II. Uh, I think there is some evidence for that. Bush actually does talk to Hitler and says, hey, uh, my front commanders are pretty sure an attack's coming. And then Hitler goes, no, it ain't. And then Bush goes, I guess you're right. <laughs> so for a few days, he was like, hey, we're in trouble here. Uh, but no, not, everything's, everything's going to be fine. It's all cool. Well, I guess just another example of someone's good sense being overridden by their adherence to an extreme ideology. Yeah, I mean, he also knows that's how he got his job, was by being a loyal Hitler guy. Um, the Germans in this sector had one Panzer Division, 20th. They had 56 tanks. Ouch, just badly understood. In total, the Germans... Badly understood. The Germans in total had a little over 100 tanks. The Soviets had a little under 4,000. Pretty even, you know, fair fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, what's going to happen to Army Group <clears throat> Army Group Center is, some people call it a foregone conclusion. Uh, you've got a superb Soviet planning for the offensive. Uh, you have one of Hitler's worst generals with a rigid defensive system. The German army is not mobile. Most of it's horse-drawn. So if you can break through, you can create massive pockets much like what the Germans had done to the Russians in 1941. And that's what occurs here. And it's doubly shocking because Army Group Center was a formation that had a good reputation on defense. They had won most defensive battles in the Eastern Front. And it's a veteran outfit. Army Group Center is filled with veterans. So this is not, you know, they're not chewing up second line troops. They're chewing up veteran infantry divisions who have a tradition of victory. The argument, of course, has been made many times. The destruction of our group center is worse than Stalingrad. Uh, certainly the obliteration of that army group is crucial to the eventual attempt on Hitler's life. Uh, which I think, keep in mind, too, with the landings in Normandy, I mean, even though they're being contained, they're not... They're, it's obvious the Allies will eventually break out. The Luftwaffe's back is broken. Rome has fallen, and at this point, Italy itself actually might completely fall. You know, they, they, the Germans didn't know the American, the Allies were going to take their troops and send them to southern France at that point. And then you have the destruction of Army Group Center. So then the attempt is made on Hitler's life. Uh, you got any thoughts on the attempt on uh, the bomb plot? Well, I mean, I think it was... All, all the senior officers had pretty much backed out of it, so it was pretty much being run by colonels. Um, and it came pretty damn <laughs> close to happening. I guess it was just bad luck 
that the bomb didn't quite get Hitler. Uh, they didn't really understand how the bomb would go off in that bunker. Um, yeah, I think the, the only the only senior commander who who had signed off on it, I guess, was Erwin Rommel. Although he didn't know that they were going to blow up the bomb, he just knew that there was an active plot to kill Hitler, and he had made it clear that he was fine with it. Yeah, he he had a sort of. It. He also, it's interesting with Rommel because I think because he eventually did come around with Hitler, there's been a tendency for people to say, "Oh, see, he was the good German general." But what's weird about Rommel is he seems to have been politically inept on a level that is hard to imagine because it took him a very long time to figure out what Nazism was, even after years of being around it while it was rising up and being a bodyguard of Hitler at one point. And he's like, "Yeah, I don't, I don't think Hitler, I don't know what Hitler stands for." They can't be that racist, can't be that bad, can't be that many atrocities, right? Somehow he was blind to this, willfully ignorant if of I had it to... for years. In a way oh, well, that I apparently mean, was I mean, frustrating to people around him. I found out, I, I always wondered, why did Rokosovsky fight for the Soviets so well? I mean, he had teeth knocked out, right? Yeah. He blamed the NKVD. He blamed Beria. He straight up said that he's he straight up swore he was a guest. Yeah, Stalin didn't really know what was going on. It's all the NKVD. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I mean, people are capable of anything, really. Um, in the case of Rommel, if I had to venture some guesses, both him and Hitler came from similar social, socioeconomic backgrounds. They were both frontline soldiers in the First World War. So both of them had resentments with the Prussian about the Prussian aristocracy and you know the class system in general. Um, and like many Germans, Rommel's like, he's a nationalist who wants Germany, you know, Deutschland über alles. I think all those things contributed to it. And, you know, you're, you're close enough to Hitler to where he's getting you command of a panzer division. And everybody, everybody in the army is like, oh my God, like Hitler just like put like essentially one of his favorites, just gave him an entire division with a crucial mission, right? And it, it works out, of course, which can only, of course, make a guy like Hitler even more confident in his decisions, right? Yeah. But, you know, Rommel, um, yeah, he actually apparently doesn't really find out about the atrocities on the Eastern Front until he talks at Blaskowitz, who he became friends with while, while he was in France. And th those two worked pretty well together. And Blaskowitz was assuring him, he's like, no, no, they're, they're slaughtering people in the East. When the Russians get to Germany, they're going to fuck this place up. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and one, one I read this one little short biography of Rommel the, the author made a good point that Rommel joined the bomb plot is not ridiculous for a number of reasons one of them is that Rommel already tended to blame superiors when shit went wrong so in his mind he's like this is Hitler's fault yeah you know so <laughs> anyway <clears throat> so I think I think that some of the things is going through his mind. Um, Kluge, as you know, had never given his full support to the bomb plot, but the plotters were pretty sure that yeah, if we do kill Hitler, he's probably just going to throw his hat in with us. Uh, but other than that, I mean, Kesselring's a Nazi, so you don't have him. Uh, Rundstedt and Guderian were opposed to it. Uh, Bush, of course, is opposed to it. Uh, Manstein seems to have never been approached at any level, but who cares? He's a moral coward to begin with. I think he was already out of command. I mean, he was relieved in April, and the bomb plot doesn't go down until July. He was, but he is still a man of some uh, influence. I mean, but you have other, other, other leading army commanders this time. You have, like, Modell. Modell is... Not like a Nazi true believer, but he's pretty damn friendly with it. And Hitler called Hitler declared Modell my best general, which I actually agree with him on that one. Um, and then you have the other guy who was coming in, uh, Schroner. You know about him, Ferdinand Schroner, or Schroner. I, I want to say we talked about him before, but I, I'm blanking on the details. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. Uh, he actually did win a a blue max uh, in the Italian campaign with Rommel. They actually were comrades, but Rommel didn't like him. Uh, Schroner is a hardcore Nazi. He was notorious for executing his own men. He was a good defensive fighter, give him credit on that. Like he, that that's something he understood, and he was good at cobbling together emergency units to try to hold a front together. 
But he one time told his chief of staff, you handle operations, I'll handle discipline. And he would fly around in his personal airplane, and wherever he would go, he would try to round up what he considered stragglers and get them to the front, and sometimes execute them. Oh, God, so the guy that guy. Hundreds, the guy, yeah, did the candy the guy killed hundreds of thousands of his own men. Yeah, to be fair to Schroeder in this regard, a lot of the frontline soldiers liked him in 1944 because he was getting rear area men to the front. You men they saw as cowards or shirkers or, you know, like, you know, guys, you know, like pencil pushers. So they, they liked that about him. But as the war goes on and they know that they're losing and he's still killing people, in fact, he's accelerating the killings. I mean, Schroeder ki- executed men the day before the war ended. He executed a bunch of soldiers. So as the war goes on, his men start to really hate his guts. But yeah, most of these men in the top positions at this point, um, some of your more anti-Nazi officers are out of power. Actually, that's the members of the bomb plot kind of run the gamut, don't they? You have those Prussian officers who were just grossed out by Hitler from the beginning, those who were horrified by the atrocities of the regime. Um, then you just had those who actually were perfectly fine with the regime. They were just upset they were out of power, like Ludwig Beck and uh, Hopner, who was a panzer commander. In uh, it was a, one of the major panzer commanders. Oh. Yeah, he was all by anti-Semitism and, and extermination. He literally was in the bomb plot because he's like, Hitler was mean to me. <laughs> yeah, I feel like a lot of those German, uh, the Prussian officers who were okay with Hitler, even if they looked down on him and had any number of complaints, I feel like a lot of their motivation for not resisting him was simply that he offered them command of large armies and a place in history. So they're like, well, all right, I find what he's doing repugnant, but it's pretty good for me personally. So let's just ride this out and see what happens. He was also, of course, good at buying off commanders. Yeah, there's um, uh, big checks every year, the Christmas bonus for all the senior officers. Christmas bonuses, large estates. I mean, Manstein was given a massive estate. Guderian was. In the case of Guderian, it was very intelligently done, too. Hitler gave Guderian land uh, that his people had owned before the First World War and had lost it. So it's not just any kind of land. He gave Guderian land that Guderian, like, sees as ancestrally his land. That is pretty shrewd. So surprised he knew that much about Guderian. No, I mean, well, the thing is, uh, you know, Hitler, whatever his military strengths and weaknesses, and he's got a lot of weaknesses, he is very good at exploiting other people and playing them off against each other. He is very good at that. Um, he is a master uh, of, like, the dark arts of politics, I would say. Yeah, so have you seen that recent movie on Netflix? Oh, it's recent as <coughs> in, like, the last five years. It was, I think, 1938 Munich the brink of war or something like that is about the Munich conference between Chamberlain and Hitler. And it follows the story of two young friends who had been classmates at Oxford. One's German, one's British. And they're trying to do a little bit of espionage. And, um, the one guy started out as a pretty hardcore supporter of Hitler, but he's turned on him and Hitler meets him. And he says, I can size up people immediately. You went to university. You think you're better than I am. And he was just trying to read this huh. guy. But anyway. That's some shit Hitler would say. No, I mean that's 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 a sentiment. That's accurately a sentiment that uh, that the Fuhrer held. And you know, of course he would be he would overstate his own importance. I mean, how many other homeless Viennese bums become like master of Europe? <laughs> well, I can't think For, of many you know, right years. offhand, to be fair. I mean, failed, failed Viennese bum artist. Well, he's not in Viennese, sorry, Austria, but he lived in Vienna at that time, right? Yeah. So, you know. I mean, I, well, I mean I'm i here in the French Quarter. Do you think, like, some homeless artist in the... I don't look at a homeless artist in the French Quarter and be like, ah, oh, that guy's going to conquer Canada one day. Well, I mean, maybe you should take a harder look. So, <laughs> so it's very... Um, uh, the, the, the bomb plot, it's a hodgepodge of people. It does almost work. I did read an account, though, that right around this time, as events in the Western Front are collapsing, one of uh, Kluge's officers said, why don't you just do what um, York did in 1813? 
So as York led the Prussian Corps in Napoleon's invasion of Russia, after Napoleon's beat, York, without permission from the King of Prussia, makes a deal with the Russians and takes his corps out of the war, and that precipitates Prussia joining the coalition. And the officer was telling Kluge, if you do this, you'll be considered a great man. And Kluge apparently said to him, uh, my friend, Hans von Kluge is not a great man. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, um, so the the uh, let me uh, let me take a really quick break. I'm going to grab some water. Uh, my voice is a bit strained from a lot of um, uh, from a, I had to do a big tour, big long tour today. So let me grab some more water, keep myself fresh, and we're going to go over the, um, the fallout of the bomb plot failing. Okay. <laughs> it's an interesting point, Phil Roman. A lot of people from the periphery rising to great prominence in these affairs. Uh, oh, uh, Bro Reale said that uh, it's pronounced Bragatian, right? Uh, Bagratian, there we go. Oh, I saw one of the comments, Sean. Apparently the name of the operation that destroyed Army Group Center is Operation Bagratian. Are you there? Okay. All right, I am back in business. Oh, yeah, I was just saying, I read one What's of the up? comments, uh, one of the users here, uh, Bro Rioli, says that the operation that destroyed Army Group Center is pronounced Bagratian. Bagratian, yes, named after, of course, the uh, famous Russian general who uh, died at Borodino. Oh, and I'm also pretty sure, I looked this up a while back, uh, the guy, the one general who committed suicide, who was a good defender... His name is actually um, Modal. Yes, yes, Modal. Um, uh, did you want to pull up any images while we're um, sure? Let's while see. we're doing this right here, what can we find here? Um, so we're about to discuss July twentieth. Yeah, yeah. If you want to show, maybe. Um, um, map of the uh, Western Front. Okay. That'd be good. Because what I'm going to do from here is do the bomb plot and then do Western Front and then back to Eastern Front. Okay. And then after that, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do a quick thing on Italy at this time and then do Western Eastern. Okay. Well, let's see. I'm struggling to find a good map here. This is a little too advanced for what we're talking about. Um, gotcha. Let's see. How about 1944? Might give us a better result. Right, let's see what I can get here. All right. That's 1940. God damn it. <coughs> okay, that's just a general map. Um, that's interesting. See, how just about so the map of the Normandy breakout? That might be a good one. That's good. Yeah, it gives good. Uh, I don't want the little more scope. How about the? Well, it's still fairly zoomed in. I guess. At least this one has the clarity, which is going to be a problem because of, uh, yeah, we'll go with this. Yeah, 
You all right? Yeah, I'm good, man. Okay. All right. So the bomb plots fall out. Um, the traditional German army salute is replaced with a Heil Hitler. Uh, 7,000 people will be arrested throughout Germany, 5,000 of whom will be killed and tortured to death. Um, a lot of the members of the bomb plot die very horrible deaths. I mean, you have the firing squads, of course, but I mean, like, guys being hung with piano wire. Uh, Hitler's uh, relationship with the army is now completely poisoned. He believes the generals are sabotaging everything. Except for, like, you know, certain key commanders who he thinks are, like, the best, the ones he trusts, naturally. Like Shorner. Uh, Shorner, Modal, a few of the other uh, men like that. Yeah, as long as Shorner has candy bars to and... hand out, all is well. <laughs> and, um, I was going to say, yeah, yeah, so the, the other consequence of the bomb plot, of course, is essentially the annihilation of a block of German officers who were even willing to do this in the first place. Most of the conspirators were, were caught, too. I mean, only a few of them uh, got away, including some more minor figures. In the cases of Rommel and Kluge, in the case of Rommel and Kluge, while they weren't intimately involved, they knew of a general plot to kill Hitler. And that's going to lead to the suicide of both men. It also creates a lot of... Uh, um, command confusion just as German just as the German armies are suffering punishing losses in the East and the West which of course leads to the Western Front Operation Cobra is launched as said, the breakout occurs the Germans are not able to contain the breakout um, the Allies eventually create what's called the Felice Pocket now a lot of the Germans escape the Felice Pocket um, it the, 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 the really, really should have been a worse defeat for the Germans than it already was, but it's already pretty goddamn bad. Um, same time Operation Dragoon, Dragoon is launched in the south. Operation Dragoon is a stunning and rapid success. Uh, they were able to overrun southern France, although I want to say the 11th Panzer Division manages to hold the Americans off just long enough for a lot of the troops to escape. The Allies now race for the western, uh, for the western border. Now, understand, the German army in the West has collapsed. And in this desperate situation, Hitler turns to Modell. Now, Modell at this point was coming from the Eastern Front. And just a quick thing what happened to the Eastern Front. After, after the destruction of the Army Group's center, Modell was sent to restore the situation. The Russians then launched that attack in the Koval area that the, that the Germans were absolutely terrified of. That offensive... Succeed in taking territory, but Modell was able to launch a series of counterattacks that restored the wet Eastern Front at a point when they believed it was when they believed it was going to completely collapse. Because keep in mind, it's not that hard to get across Poland. I mean, Poland is one of the hardest places to defend. I mean, it's a corridor of invasion essentially. So, Modell's defensive achievement there really earns him the nickname of the Furious Firefighter, since he's just there to put out those fires. <laughs> But he launched a series of counterattacks that were very effective. Uh, Modell himself was, I, I do think, actually, he's probably the best all-around German general of World War II. Uh, he did actually he was he he kind of came from the same background as like you know Hitler and Rommel and some of the other ones. Uh, but he had great staff work, good use of intelligence, uh, ca very capable of launching successful counterattacks, and he repeatedly rescued desperate situations. So the counterattacks that he launches in the Warsaw area help blunt the Soviet advance. Of course, at the same time, you have the Warsaw Uprising, which, you know, Stalin's all but willing to let them die there. <laughs> Still controversy over exactly what was going on, but I do think that Stalin wasn't going to put too much of an effort to save Warsaw at that very moment. But anyway, so Modell is then sent west after having restored the situation in the east. This leads us to Operation Market Garden. Now, Operation Market Garden is landing of three paratrooper divisions to seize several bridges in the Netherlands. From there, the British expected to attack into the North German Plain, um, an area that's very hard to defend. So get over the Rhine, and you're once again in a territory that favors the attacker, not the defender, so much. 
Now, contrary to popular belief, the British did know there were SS Panzer divisions near Arnhem. They just believed that the they just believed that the uh, the German army was in such a horrible state that nothing could stop them, or not nothing, but you know that they, they would it would be relatively easy. Uh, but the Germans were receiving new equipment. Modell was in command. In fact, Modell was actually right near Arnhem when the landings happened. And of course, Operation Market Garden fails. There's a lot of reasons for it, but among them is the Germans made a very swift reaction. Modell is there on the spot, and they have SS forces and other uh, Panzer groups in the area. Yeah, I want to say uh, Modell was actually at Excellent. dinner, and he looked out his window after he got a report, and he could see parachutes in the distance. Yeah, which I believe is lends its name to a to the title of a book I haven't read yet about Market Garden called "It Never Snows in September." Yes, and I think because the paratroopers landed fairly close to his position, he had to hustle to safety because, of course, his staff was worried he'd be captured, and that would really fuck up their defense. Yeah, exactly. That would be an interesting uh, alternative Garden scenario, really wouldn't it? Where like the paratroopers land on Modal and take him captive. Yeah, the, the the interesting thing about that too is um, Market Garden really signals signals to the Western Allies that no, the Germans aren't beat, and you have a variety of other things too. So the Germans do actually hold a bridgehead in France during this time, called the Colomer Pocket. Uh, Patton's advance in the Metz area is slow. His losses pile up, and then of course you have the infamous fighting in the Hurricane Forest, where American infantry regiment divisions are just chewed up to pieces. Uh, so uh, the Western Allies were also hurt, of course, by logistics. Uh, there was only so much gas they could get over. Most of the ports were still in German hands or had been thoroughly wrecked. And Montgomery, in trying in doing Market Garden, put his resources there instead of trying to secure the um, secure uh, access to Antwerp. So they had to do that operation over a period of time. What Modell did in the West, by the way, is actually is referred to sometimes as the miracle of the West. And it's debatably really Germany's last major victory of World War II. Concurrent with it is the stabilization of the, of the situation in Italy. The German forces withdrew to the Gothic line, and the Americans and British launched an offensive there. This offensive is very World War I esque. Um, the actual German official history said that this was the only campaign where it was fought according to the official manual on how to fight defensive battles, at least in the grand sense. And the Gothic Line defenses are on the verge of collapse when Churchill says, send troops to Greece. Now the reason for this is the Russians at this time have launched an offensive in Romania. And can you guess what army they destroyed in Romania, they surrounded and destroyed? Which army? I mean, the Romanian, I guess, right? They, they, they cut through some Romanians, and the Romanians start surrendering. Of course, the Romanians are going to join the Russians. Same thing with the Bulgarians. But nope, it's Sixth Army. Oh, the reconstituted Sixth Army. Yeah. Reconstituted Sixth Army. Not only reconstituted Sixth Army, get this. Their flanks were held by the Romanians that caved in. Oh, God. So it's like, you know... Yeah, it's fucking Stalingrad the sequel. <laughs> Um, yeah, something about that's German the area Sixth of Armies, off. they just don't do well, I guess. I don't know, I'll have to look into the German no, Sixth Army don't. from World War One, but uh, I don't know, the World War Two German Army, yeah. uh, Sixth Army is just a doomed unit. Yeah. So Sixth Army is destroyed again. Germans, uh, Bulgaria and Romania are going to side with Russia. The Germans have to pull out of Greece and Yugoslavia. Uh, Greece had a very strong communist movement. Churchill, in an effort to make sure Greece doesn't go communist, because Churchill is looking to the future Cold War, has forces transferred from Italy to over there, and that is why the Italian... That's a, one of the reasons why the Italian front is stabilized in late 1944. Um, yes, the British commander apparently cursed all day when he was... I think it was uh, Oliver Lesse was the commander. Pretty good general... I believe he cursed all day when he was given the orders to start transferring men to Greece. So, just from the German front line, look, I sent a crack in Italy, it holds, and the German forces are able to rally in the west. 
This time of the West, too, they, they institute something called the Volksgrenadier Division. Do you know what this is? Those were the People's Infantry Divisions, which were basically the older guys, sometimes the teenagers who were not yet old enough, they would be put into units and sent to hold positions or fill lot gaps in the line. <laughs> sort of. Um, you're kind of thinking in some ways, I think, more of like Volkstrom. Ah, uh, the Volkstrom, yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, Volk Volkstrom, you know, armed sometimes with like Franco-Prussian weapons. Uh, the best of the Volkstrom, of course, were just World War One veterans. I just found out uh, what the uh, what the Volkstrom are called by the Russians and the Germans. The Russians called them totals, says in they were the sign of total mobilization. The Germans called them casserole because they said it was um, green vegetables and old meat. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Germans got have some good dark, have a pretty good dark sense of humor when they want to. Um, Volksgrenadier are smaller infantry divisions. Uh, they tended to have experienced sergeants and officers with inexperienced infantry. And a lot of them were younger and older. Uh, but they are meant to be straight infantry. But they were created as emergency units in the Western Front. And as far as being created as emergency units to hold the area, they are effective. They also, uh, uh, because the German war production was at its height in late 1944, they tend to be armed somewhat lavishly, like a lot of assault guns and submachine guns. But anyway, the Western Front is stabilized, and for the time being, so is the Eastern Front, except in the South. You know, Romania has been overrun, Bulgaria. The Germans are, I mean, the Russians are now pressing towards Hungary. Now, Hungary is kind of interesting. At this time, they're ruled by Admiral Horthy. Uh, which is funny, right? It's a landlocked country run by an admiral, huh? Yeah, that's pretty fucking um, weird. But he had How'd been, that happen? Yeah, he had been... I don't know a ton about Horthy, but I know he was a high-ranking admiral in the Austro-Hungarian Navy, and he played an important role in Hungarian independence, but also in making sure Hung Hungary didn't go communist. Because remember, there's a Hungary had a communist government for a few months. Uh, but that failed. Anyway, Horthy was going to deal with the Soviets, so Hitler... Um, had his, I think they had his son kidnapped and tortured. I want to say, Horthy himself was captured. The SS were the, the SS and German forces then overran Hungary and forced Hungary to stay in the war. Uh, this also leads to the last um, big influx of concentration camp victims of victims of the Holocaust because you know Hungary and Romania and Italy had all refused to turn their Jews over to Hitler. In the case of Italy, doubly so because uh, a lot of Jews were very were, were supporters of fascism. Now, when Mussolini fell, he acquiesces to the seizure of Jews because at this point, Mussolini is a puppet. Uh, Romania, of course, was overrun by the Soviets, so that even happen. In the case of Hungary, now the Hungarian Jews are seized and will be killed. Uh, one of the most famous victims of that was um, Eli Wiesel, who wrote um, uh, the book Night, which is a great book. Anyway. But the Hungarians are still in the fight, man. <laughs> so there's still Hungarian forces out in the field. Uh, I don't know a lot about the Hungarian army at this time, to be honest. I'd like to read up more on that. It's my understanding and, they're uh, mostly they're equipped with, like, second-rate German stuff. Yeah. So the Germans were giving them some of their <laughs> old panzers as they replaced them. Now, the, Soviet, the Soviets in fall of 1944 launch a series of offensives. One is to try to get into East Prussia. It fails. Another one is to press into Hungary. It's only somewhat successful. So you do have it late 1944, the Germans being able to stabilize all three fronts after all three fronts suffered a major collapse. Uh, at this point, of course, the German army is even better armed than before. Um, however... They're still short on Panzer, so groups like Panzer Lair, for instance, was using a lot of assault guns. Um, but still, uh, the, the Germans are now able to build up major reserves. And this is when Hitler has to consider his options. What does he do? Attack in the East? Or attack in the West? Attacking in Italy is not going to happen, right? <laughs> yeah. It's not important enough. Uh, there, was, there was, by the way, some discussion of a mass 
offensive in Italy in like late 1943. And uh, the Italian army in Italy actually will launch a limited but very successful offensive in December 1944, where they mauled, I want to say it was the 92nd Infantry Division, which was uh, kind of the uh, successor to the Buffalo Soldiers. Oh, damn, okay. Yeah, yeah, they, it's the only all-black infantry division of World War II that America fields. They were sent to Italy, and they suffered from low morale. I mean, you know, they're fighting the segregated army. I believe, I believe the bulk of their officers were white, if not all of them. So it, they, they speci- the, the Italians specifically target that division because they're like, you know, from what we can tell, they're not in the best state. The 92nd did do a lot better in Italy in 1945, but in 1944, they don't do so well, and they get mauled pretty bad. Damn, okay, I didn't know about that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's actually called Operation Winter Storm. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> so yeah, there will be an offensive there, but what does Hitler do? Do you attack in the east or do you attack in the west? What do you think? Attack in the west. And why the west? I want to say it wasn't. He, then he had some sort of belief that the Americans were soft, so if we could deal them a hard blow, it would knock them out. Not necessarily. Hitler believed that the Soviets simply. I mean, the Soviet resource is not infinite. By the end of the war, your average infantry division of the Soviets only has four thousand men, and at this point, they've got seven thousand. So the Soviets are undergoing what's their, their own manpower crisis, but they've got a lot more equipment. They can take the losses better, and they're okay with taking the losses. I found out that when Russian generals would ask about casualties, do you know, what, you, know, you, know you know what's a popular expression? Uh, how many matches were burned? Hmm. So he knows the Western allies are not as capable of taking losses, especially the British. The British are having, a, having their own manpower crisis at this point. Only the Americans are able to lavish themselves a lot of troops. In the case of the Americans, the losses had been much heavier in Western Europe than they thought. So the Americans were cannibalizing divisions at home for replacements. One of the most famous examples of that is the 106th Infantry Division, which gets destroyed in the Battle of the Bulge. One of the reasons the division did so poorly is the division was originally constituted and trained together, but then it was cannibalized to get send replacements to the front. Um, by the way, you ever read about the American replacement system in World War II? Not much, but I know that there were just guys who kind of showed up on trucks like, hey, I'm in your squad now. It was bad. It was a very bad system. Uh, besides the fact they were cannibalizing divisions to send men to the front, let's say you were wounded and sent to the rear. A lot of times you'd be just sent to a new division instead of your old one. I didn't know that. That's, That's really dumb. Yeah, that's not good. Well, they would think they were thinking not like we need to keep the unit together. They were thinking much more like what division needs men right now. Uh, which you know that that, that I, it's, there's there's a logic to it, but ultimately it 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 did decrease combat effectiveness, especially by late 1944. Um, <clears throat> now in the West, the Germans are merely considering attack. That's what Germans do. Model and Rundstedt. Rundstedt's been returned. Both want an attack, what they what was called the small solution. Hitler, though, I think correctly understood that that would never do. That if he had any chance to win this war, and we know that he doesn't, but in his mind, who knows what will happen, he needs to be able to win a crushing victory in the West that will send the Allies reeling and could possibly cause a breakup in the alliance between France, Britain, and the Soviet Union. Now, the French, I'm sorry, the Americans and the British, especially as the war goes on, get more and more antagonistic towards each other, particularly because Churchill is much more wary of the Soviet Union than Roosevelt is. And I don't subscribe to the whole, like, Roosevelt gave away shit at Yalta thing, but the more stuff I've read, I think a lot of Americans, Roosevelt and Eisenhower, were kind of a bit naive about the Soviets. Uh, But more crucial is a rift between the Soviet Union and the West. So Hitler's hoping that if he can win a great victory, that he can possibly knock the British out of the war by destroying their forces and precipitate a kind of crisis in the alliance. That's what he's hoping for. Also, uh, it's interesting... I think he's uh, correct to see that... 
He's got to do it big. He's got to go big or go home. I think he's correct in that analysis. Uh, you were saying? Oh uh, well, uh, one thing I read earlier is that apparently the British general Alan Brooke was present at a lot of the major conferences with the big three, and he came in with the impression that Stalin might be a strategic genius because apparently in those meetings Stalin portrayed himself very well or conducted himself really well, and Alan Brooke thought that Stalin as a strategist was leagues above Churchill and Roosevelt. But then again, I mean, as we discussed, I Alan so Brooke wasn't well. exactly, you know, the best general himself, but whatever. I, 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 I've, uh, I've, uh... I, I have a fairly good regard for Alan Brooke overall, but uh, um, no, he conducted himself very well at the meetings. Uh, one thing to sort of note is, <clears throat> you know, Eisenhower <clears throat> briefed the Soviets on what he was doing throughout the campaign very accurately. The Soviets would withhold information or just lie to him about what they were even doing or where they were even going to attack. Like before the Soviets attacked Berlin, they actually told Eisenhower, "Yeah, we're not going there." And then when they launched the offensive, they said, "Yeah, Berlin's not our target. Our target's Dresden." You know? <laughs> I guess at that point the lie was um, super obvious, though. Eisenhower kept playing along because of the need to try to keep the alliance together. But you, one can start to see the seeds of the, of the Cold War there in many ways, and uh, you know there's 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 a lot of there's a lot of mutual suspicion. But some of the stuff the Soviets do, especially in terms of Poland as well, is really going to poison the water. Uh, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> Hitler settles on what was called the Big Solution, which will be known as the Battle of the Bulge, the Ardennes, count, the Ardennes Offensive, uh, with, the, with the colorful name Watch on the Rhine. Um, the, the Bulge is an attempt to kind of replicate 1940, only this time when you pe punch through the Ardennes, you're not going for the channel per se, you're going for Antwerp. You, know, you seize the biggest port, the main supply base, and then you cut the Western Allies in two. Yeah, to be this fair, offensive uh, is going to fail. Yeah, I don't think Antwerp's it's actually a port. On this map, it is a little bit inland. It's a port. Oh. It's on a river. No, trust me, it's it's okay. it's it's a it's the main port for the Allies at this point. All right. Well, on this map, I guess this map um, got the rivers a little off them. But... <laughs> oh well, don't worry about it. So, yeah, whatever, man. So what's going to happen here is, um, for the Battle of the Bulge, uh, the reason, it's going to fail for a lot of reasons. Um, one of them is that they're attacking into the Ardennes, which is not a good good terrain for tanks. The, the French analysis in 1940 was essentially correct. They kind of overstated how bad it was for tanks. But no, it's not good for tanks. The Panther you're talking about, the Panther does really poorly in the Ardennes because... The Panther, if it did have a weakness, it wasn't that great on the sides. Like it's, it's very armor is great in the front though, uh, but Panthers get mauled pretty bad in the Ardennes Forest. Anyway, you have more troops in the Ardennes than were there in 1940, and tank weapons and tactics are far better than 1940. I mean, in 1940, a group of Panzer ones could rout French infantry. That's not going to happen this time. Well, part of it, too, is that uh, um, the short-barreled tanks had an easier time getting through the Ardennes. When you got the long barrels, it's hard to turn or maneuver at all. And also, these tanks are much yeah, heavier. Yeah, very true. Much heavier. More troops there. Experienced troops, in many cases. Um, the, the Battle of the Bulge, they had the 106th Infantry Division is new, and I believe the 99th Infantry Division was there as well. But you also had 2nd Infantry and 28th. 20th was spread thin, but 28th is a veteran unit, and so is the 2nd. So, another big problem with the Ardennes counteroffensive, they don't have enough logistics for it, so some of the German plans relies on capturing gas. Never a good idea. The plan also relies on Allied aircraft being grounded due to bad weather. Okay, so you just gotta hope the weather stays bad the whole time, right? Not a good idea. Also, a lot of the reasons that the 1940 attack worked was the Germans had launched an offensive to the north of the Ardennes that fooled the French. Because the French, for one thing, they couldn't get their reconnaissance aircraft in to know what was precisely going on, and that's where the French and British expected the blow to come anyway. Hence why you can get behind them. There is no secondary attack with the Ardennes. So when they punch through, Eisenhower very quickly says, this is a major effort, and i got to throw troops in. Very quickly. 
reacts to the situation. Do you think their, ep- many their ways effort per- was after right? Nordwind was to try to make the Allies think, oh shit, maybe the Bulge wasn't the main attack. Sort of. We'll get to Nordwind in a sec. N- N- Nordwind, Yodel came with Nordwind. <laughs> um, so the, um, sorry, so the, there's no secondary attack to fool them. And um, a lot of the attack is based on the SS because Himmler at this time is now Hitler's favorite. Hitler trusts the SS. The SS is undergoing a massive expansion of its forces. The SS is being given the most, the, a lot of SS divisions are actually overstrength. They're being lavished with the best equipment, which is creating even more animosity between army and SS units. Hitler decides that he's going to rely on 6th Panzer, 6th Panzer Army, which later is renamed 6th SS Panzer Army, to make the main breakthrough. There's a problem, though. It's a big problem. Um, the terrain they're assigned to is very rough. Their commander is Sepp Dietrich, who was a very good division commander, but he is army is beyond his capabilities. He's going he's to spend part of this battle just drunk. Um, also, one of the biggest weaknesses with the SS overall was very poor staff work. Uh, you know, SS emphasized you know aggression and combat capabilities and promotion based on merit, and you know, ger- I mean, German staff work on things like logistics were already kind of poor to begin with in the army. That well, average might be a better way, or maybe, or you know, like like German staffs emphasized logistics was like kind of secondary. The SS are even worse about that. So there's a massive traffic jam, an army commander who is way over his head, attacking into difficult terrain. The 6th Panzer Army barely makes any headway. It turns to be 5th Panzer Army that makes the big breakthrough. Uh, but the Allies react pretty quickly to it. Uh, Eisenhower in the confusion gives Bradley command the southern shoulder, Montgomery command the northern shoulder. Controversial decision at the time, but a correct one. Montgomery is able to organize the defenses properly. It's one of Montgomery's best moments. Although Montgomery later played that up, which made Eisenhower really hate his guts. Um, and you know the Battle of the Bulge it's, it's a ferocious battle and they did gain surprise and there was a, a German breakthrough but enough allied forces like I said Baston, St. Vith are holding out to slow the offensive down uh, German armored losses are pretty heavy in this one as well I want to say the Germans lose four to five hundred tanks we, we lose more but you know they just can't afford it at this point <laughs> And, you know, a number of divisions that had already been mauled at Normandy and have and had to be reconstituted with, you know, inexperienced men get mauled again. So in the middle of this situation, Guderian is telling Hitler the Eastern Front is going to crack. As he, he told Hitler was a house of cards. And Guderian was arguing that the Panzer Reserve should have been shifted to the East because the East was where the real threat was. Guderian's thinking was that the West, the terrain was good for defense, the Allies weren't making much headway, but if the Russians break through in Poland, I mean, they can be in Berlin in a month, is what he's thinking. But then Budapest gets surrounded. So Hitler's meager reserves in the Eastern Front are shifted to free take Budapest, that's Operation Conrad which does better than it should have, but still doesn't work in the end. Budapest will fall after some horrific, um, horrific uh, street fighting. With the very last of his reserves in the West, Hitler launches what you mentioned already, Operation Nordwind. Uh, The idea behind Nordwind was to link up with the Columnar Pocket and try to inflict heavy losses because they knew that the Allies in the area had been stretched thin as they had to send men into the bulge. So it's, they're trying to take advantage of the fact they might they have local superiority. They want to hook up with the Kalmar pocket and retake Strasbourg. Uh, Nordwind is a very, uh, uh, is a, is a, is a pretty fierce battle. You know, fought in January in the middle of the snow. Everybody involved in it said it was one of the worst battles on the Western Front. But it's kind of pointless, don't you think? I mean, I mean, all this is pointless. The Germans have lost, right? But, yeah. I mean... What the hell are they hoping? No, uh, it, it's at that point you're just kind of like, you just kind of feel like Hitler and Yodel are like, um, let's just throw some shit at the wall and see if it sticks. 
Yeah, I mean, it seems like they're just flinging their troops around at this point. Because uh, one thing's interesting about Conrad is that when it's launched at Budapest, this is at a time when the Russian armies are already not far from Berlin. Yeah. So it's a weird, it's a weird thing to be attacking to the south. What, a couple hundred miles to the south? when you have Russians maybe 20 miles, 30 miles from your capital. Well, Hungary has some oil fields that Hitler wants to secure, because Palesti's gone in uh, Palestetti, the one in Roma the Rom Romanian oil fields. Uh, so he wants to secure oil fields, and he wants to keep the Hungarians in the fight. But you're right. You, you got all that going on. And then at the same time, you have Army Group Corland, which was the Army Group, which is the sequel to Army Group North, they're now cut off in the Baltic. And Guderian the whole time is saying, we need to remove those troops from the Baltic and send them here. Now, Hitler's thinking for keeping them in Courland was because Donitz said, if you do that, the Baltic Sea will become a Soviet lake and those U-boats will not be able to train to take on the Americans. To take, I'm sorry, to take on the Western Allies and the renewed Battle of the Atlantic. At the same time, <clears throat> Hitler did know that the forces at Courland were keeping Soviet divisions busy. The Soviets are constantly attacking in the Baltic. While Stalin did call uh, Army Group Courland a prestige garrison, he did want it level. He did want it, you know, destroyed so he could shift forces to the main axis in advance. So keeping men in Courland wasn't necessarily stupid. What's stupid is that Hitler kept as many men as he kept in Courland. That's the problem. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Hitler essentially told Guderian in two different meetings the Eastern Front must try to survive on its own. Um, eventually, uh, Harp, who is the uh, army group commander in the area, he was there, he was a modal favorite, and a, another one of those panzer pioneers. Harp had this plan to where the Germans would retreat from their forward line of defense to a backup line. The Soviets would shell the empty trench and then run into the backup line where they would, could, would suffer heavy losses. Hitler would hear none of it, of course. Um, you know, they were to die, they were to fight for every inch of ground that they could, and the Panzer Reserves, the meager ones they had, were kept very far to the front, very close to the front. And this is all a recipe for disaster. This is what's known as the Vistula Odor Offensive. You know much about this? Not a ton, no. Sometimes considered the Soviet Union's uh, most successful operation of the war. Um, I mean, you know, uh, Destruction Army Group Center is, is, of course, a big one. But the Soviets did take pretty heavy losses doing it. They're not going to take as heavy a losses in this one. So Zhukov and Stavka spent five months planning this. They, this is they're given the most time and preparation to get things going. <laughs> Originally, was, the attack was set for January 16th. They launched on January 12th, um, which is good for them because actually the Germans had figured out when they were going to attack. So Stalin's last minute decision to attack a few days earlier was a, was a very good one in this case. Uh, so Zhukov and Koniv break through... Um, was, it, was it called Army Group Center at that time? Um, I can't tell from the new... map here. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up something right quick. I want I want to make sure because around this time the the Germans start just renaming all their army groups constantly instead of trying to you know keep it. Um, you know instead of just trying to stay consistent. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> was yeah. that just to try to confuse the Soviets, here. or was there an actual reason? I don't know, man. Oh no, no, it's it's um, no, it's Army Group A, led by Harp. Army Group Center is to the north, led by Reinhardt. Reinhardt was another. Uh, Reinhardt was a Guderian favorite, another Panzer pioneer. Although he was um, uh, he was particularly well. His units, his Panzer units, though, were particularly known for war crimes. But anyway, um, <clears throat> the Soviets destroy Army Group A in four days. Their artillery is massed. I mean, it's like wheel to wheel. And actually, when Hitler was told how many artillery they had, he said the Soviets aren't made of artillery. No, it turns out they are. 
Yeah, they could fire, I think, what is it, they could mass like 30,000 guns at certain points. Yeah, they, 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 I mean, they blow right through. Uh, Zhukov also was a really big fan of the Katushka rocket, and those really rained death on the Germans. Because, they, because it allows you to f throw a lot of ordnance down in a very uh, short amount of time. Um, yeah, so the Army Bay just disappears in four days. Warsaw is captured, uh, falls. The Soviets then race to the Oder River. Hitler at the last minute, though, pulls out reserves from East Prussia and from, um, uh, from the Baltic at the last minute. You know, forces that probably should have been there to begin with. Anyway, yeah, they just rip right through. The only, the only problem the Soviets have is their initial attack in East Prussia doesn't go as well. German defenses there were strong. And um, a lot of this, the, the Soviet uh, third Belarusian front was made up of a lot of inexperienced soldiers with a, some cases with, a, some cases with minimal training. So losses there were very, very high. Anyway, God, only about within a little over two weeks, the Soviets are 40 miles from Berlin. They've completely overrun Poland. Um, yeah. And Silo Heights is not that far. That's correct. Uh, <coughs> Soviets established a series of bridgeheads in the Oder River. Uh, the only thing, though, is that at this time, Stalin stops them from going into Berlin. There's a lot of reasons for this. Some it's, I mean, it's hard to know everything because some, you know, so many Russian, our Russian archives are still closed. They don't open briefly. Um, but anyway, there's a lot of reasons for this. One argument that's been made, uh, Christopher Duffy made it in Red Storm Over the Reich, great book, by the way, that Stalin did not go to Berlin right away because he wanted to consolidate his gains elsewhere, you know, in Hungary and the Baltic coast. It should also be said, though, that Soviet logistics were starting to break down. They had outrun their own aircraft, so the Luftwaffe enjoys its last moment of glory. Um, Stukas actually are blowing up tanks at will uh, along the Oder. The Germans launch Operation Solstice, which fails, but it surprises the Soviets and does inflict fairly heavy losses. And the, the Germans do at least succeed in rescuing um, a small pocket. Also, the weather turned bad as well. Now, Chuikov, who was the commander of the 8th Guards Army, and Chuikov was famous for fighting in Stalingrad. Uh, Chuikov did not like Zhukov, by the way. And Chuikov complained that if he had just simply been allowed to press on to Berlin, he could have ended the war, you know, by Valentine's Day. That was his thinking. You think he was right? Uh, probably. There really wasn't much in the way. Uh, the Germans spend the next few weeks cobbling together whatever they can. Um, and I mean, like, I mean, the forces they cobble together, they're going to get destroyed, of course. But but still, I mean, that that would have been their chance. But it was stopped for a variety of reasons. There was also an emphasis on trying to clear out East Prussia and what they called the um, the Baltic Balcony in Pomerania, which which made sense. I mean, once again, the, 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 the Soviets not done particularly well in East Prussia. So there were major forces there. And then Hitler, trans Hitler at this point has to stop the Ardennes counteroffensive and Operation Nordwind and then send formations to the east. But instead of sending them to defend Berlin, he sends them to Hungary for another attack. <laughs> yeah. You know about this one? Uh, I thought this one was Operation Conrad. No, this is Operation Spring Awakening. Okay, I've never heard of that before. This is the last major German offensive of World War II. Its objective is to retake Budapest. Uh, it's going to be done by sixth, now 6th SS Panzer Army. Uh, the offensive is a flaming disaster. I mean, like a lot of German offensives, the initial push sees them wrecking some Soviet units at the front line, but once they get beyond that, they start taking heavy losses. Uh, is this also some of the Dietrich? SS units. Yeah, this is Dietrich. Um, now Dietrich, by this time, had already even back to even back at Normandy. Dietrich was already kind of starting to say to people like, "Ah, oh, no, man, I think maybe Hitler's made a big mistake here." <laughs> but 
But a lot of the SS units, some of them fled from battle. Because the SS by this time, I mean, they're losing faith. SS leaders are negotiating with uh, the Soviets. Like, you know, well, Himmler's trying to negotiate with the Western Allies. Um, a wolf who's down in Italy is trying to is negotiating with the Americans, including uh, Dulles, uh, the one who would later on become uh, head of the CIA, I believe. <laughs> so the SS, you know, this is not, you know, great premier elite SS. And they, I mean, at this point, they're, they're, they're even, they're even like allowing hemophiliacs into the, into their ranks. So anyway, Hitler actually ordered that the SS units there rip off their armbands. That would show what unit they were a part of. Because remember, all SS units have a name. Typically some like ethnic, a lot of times ethnic references. Like, you know, the, uh, the French SS is SS Charlemagne, for instance. Um... So, you know, if you've got a, if you're like one of these hardcore Nazi guys and you've got like a thing that says like lifeguard of Adolf Hitler, that's a big deal to you. And they're being told, take them off. Was that because Hitler didn't um, think they were good enough anymore or because he didn't want them to get massacred on site if they surrendered? Uh, that would be the first option. Hitler likes they're dying right now. I mean... The Fuhrer is in, is in Gotadamerung mode, you know, Twilight of the Gods, the last opera of Wagner's Ring Cycle. Um, and, 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 you know, Hitler by this time thought that the German people were him and he was the German people, so the German people cannot survive without him. Uh, so his opinion is that Germany will become a, a, an ash heap and that the SS have failed him. The fanatical soldiers who were supposed to win the Ardennes, you know, had failed him there, right? The army were the ones who did better than the Ardennes. He can't deny that. Hell, um, in Nordwind, the SS Panzer Grenadier Division put in was outperformed by a Volksgrenadier Infantry Division. Well, I mean, so I, for yeah, him, I think he's also Hitler, think, so Hitler thought like he had basically done nothing wrong; it's just his men had failed him. Yes, increasingly. Yeah, it sounds a lot like a, um, like he's a getting Roman worse. attitude where the you know Senate would decide, well, we didn't fuck this up. It was just the soldiers not being brave enough. Yes, this is a Roman senatorial attitude. I'm sure Hitler would approve. Um, and I mentioned the SS doing negotiations. In Italy, Mark Clark will eventually attack around March and will blow through the German positions and then over on the Po River Valley. Uh, very well done. I mean... Granted, by that time, you know, morale's down, right? But still, it's a really well-done operation. Mark Clark should get credit for that one. But during that time, yeah, the head SS guy in Italy is negotiating to end the war in Italy. <coughs> so, <clears throat> and that actually put a lot of, that, that actually spooked out Stalin, because he started thinking, like, well, wait a second, maybe the uh, Germans will negotiate, because Stalin, one of his fears was that the Germans would negotiate a separate peace with Britain and France. Britain, France, and America, and then shift all their forces to fight in the Eastern Front. Yeah, which I guess, given how the Soviets were getting ground down, that could have been an actual threat. It could have been, but it's, I mean, like, it's so much paranoia. But, I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about the Soviets, right? I mean, paranoia is their middle name. Well, especially with Stalin um, more than any I, other person in the Soviet yeah. Union. Oh, last thing I wanted to mention, too, about the um, German generals at this time... This, in the Eastern Front, you see the final Nazification of the German High Command. Because guys like Harp and Reinhardt are fired, and the three main army group commanders on the Eastern Front now are Rindelak in East Prussia, an Austrian Nazi party member um, who, who was, was a, um, committed a variety of war crimes in Finland and Yugoslavia. You have Schroner in charge as well. And Army Group Vistula is given to Henrik Himmler, which <laughs> you don't get more Nazi than that, do you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's about as bad as it gets. It's when so you know you're scraping eventually the bottom Himmler, of the though, Yeah, Himmler, I mean, you know, he made a lot of mistakes, and then he eventually kind of was overwhelmed by the whole thing, so the command was turned over to Heinrichi. Oh, and the very last one is Guderian's out. I forgot to mention that. Guderian had become... Uh, chief of staff after the bomb plot partially because he had stayed loyal to the regime and told people we should be good national socialists 
Uh, Guderian definitely liked Nazism and aspects of it, but he was never he was never convinced of the entire thing, and he definitely, no matter what, would speak his mind to Hitler. They got into a lot of furious arguments. Uh, but anyway, uh, Guderian is given a, is told to take a six week leave of absence in late March. That leads to Hans Krebs taking over another. Uh, while, while the other ones I just named, like Himmler, Rendelak, and Schroner, are actually like official members of the party, I don't think Krebs was, but he was considered a loyal Nazi. So he was considered loyal say, and pretty Nazi. Would it be safe to say someone like Guderian was more of, was not a yes man, but rather a yes but man? Like a guy who yes. is okay with what's going on, but wants to quibble about the details and got under Hitler's skin. Yeah, and Guderian was always a guy, he was, he was one of those men who was like, I'm always right, I and mean, he was notorious for his arguments anyway. Um, and from what I can tell, what I remember, Guderian, I don't think he really cared much about the racial theory stuff. He was more into the whole, like, yeah, we got to conquer the East and create an empire, and communism sucks. <laughs> um, he's definitely, like, he's definitely an ultra-nationalist. Um, so, you know, that's, that's just what I've gathered. On, on the Guderian front. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so yeah, by, 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 but within the last weeks of World War II, the, the, the German high command is thoroughly Nazified. Meanwhile, on the Western Front, after the bulge was a failure, the Allies then have to churn to get to the Rhine. This is, there's some pretty fierce fighting. The Germans don't retreat behind the Rhine. They try to hold every inch of territory, which means for, a lot of their forces are too far forward. Um, probably the last really ferocious fight on the Western Front happens in the Northern Sector, where the Canadians have to fight Folschenjäger. There's some very bitter fighting around there. But then, early in March 1945, the bridge at Remagen is seized, which gives the Allies a crossing over the Rhine. Now, technically, there already was a crossing in the South. You know, Devers had gotten a crossing, but... Eisenhower didn't like Devers, and also Eisenhower didn't see it as the main axis of advance, so he didn't put a lot of men into it. He just said, yeah, Devers, go, go do your thing and not stop bothering me. Um, <laughs> but Ramagan gets seized. The Allies start pushing everything they can. The Americans do everything they can into that bridgehead. Interesting thing about the bridge of Ramagan, too. The five officers who were implicated in failing to blow the bridge were all summarily executed at Hitler's orders. Uh, which caused a shockwave amongst the German officer class. No trial, just execution. Um, and that's something to keep in mind, too. Uh, you know, people are like, why are the Germans still fighting? Well, in the West, they're starting to crumble. They're now starting to surrender in larger numbers, especially once, once the Allies are over the Rhine, both the Remagen and with Montgomery's operation to the north. Yeah, the Germans start surrendering in mass. They collapse. And there's still some fighting in the locations, especially with SS units. But, yeah, they're melting away right now. Why fight in the East? Well, many of them don't. There are lots of deserters. Lots of, lots of, lots of men are being hidden away in basements in Berlin. And lots of men are trying to filter to the West to surrender to the Americans. But a lot of them are going to keep on fighting because in their mind, I, you know, some of them are fanatical Nazis, of course, but a lot of them are like, we need to hold on to the Oder line to allow as many Germans as possible to escape west is one line of thinking. Another one, of course, are the tales of Soviet atrocities. And many of them believe that Germany will be dismembered anyway. They've already heard the rumors from both Stalin and things from the American camp about, you know, ripping Germany apart and having it no longer exist. But another one is just plain fear. There are roving bands of, of, of SS and army police who will hang you on sight. It doesn't even matter your age. They hanged Hitler youth for abandoning their units. Schoner in particular is notorious for this. Usually if you hang somebody, they'd put a plaque around their sign that said, I refuse to defend German women and children. Now here I'll give you a personal thing. My dad used to date a woman who was in Berlin in 1945. And I spoke to her last year and she mentioned about hiding away in an attic and then right down there was a crew of kids. They were like 16 or 17 manning an anti-tank gun, like a, um, 
And her mom went to them and said, this is over. You're going to die. Why don't you come up in the attic with us? And they pointed, there was an SS uh, command post nearby, and they said, they'll kill us. And she said that a week later, or not a week later, like a, like a day later, they noticed they were gone. And then when they went, they were, you know, you go out to like get supplies and whatnot, they actually ran to both their bodies hanging. They had tried to run away, and they were executed. Damn. Uh, the number of Germans being executed this time by these summer squads, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but probably somewhere around 10,000 is what I would think. So they're not doing this in the West. I mean, well, they're probably, maybe they're trying to in the West, right? But, I mean, people in the West are like, whatever, surrender the Americans, surrender the British. Which, you know, isn't always the greatest thing ever. The Americans are getting so many prisoners they can't properly treat them, so there actually was a variety of deaths and some mistakes made in the prisoner camps. I mean, American soldiers are like any other conquering army. They do a lot of looting uh, and pillaging, too. You know, there are, you know, incidences of rape and whatnot. But this is nothing like the Soviet Union. So the Roar Pocket is created. Um, Modell kills himself. Uh, by that time, Modell was absolutely disgusted with the regime. Um, and But he also said, field marshals don't surrender, and it's all over anyway. Uh, so... Rather than, like, spend the rest of his life trying to defend himself and saying he wasn't a real Nazi, Modell goes out like a man and shoots himself. Um, so anyway, Hitler gets really sad when he hears about Modell dying. That's when he says, he was my best general. And I'm like, yes, Fuhrer, he actually was. <laughs> he pulled off He pulled off shit that... He pulled off some shit in the West and the East that I have not seen any other commander do in World War II. In, you know, in very desperate situations. So... Uh, brilliant military commander, I think. Or at least a damn good one. But anyway, so Modell is dead. Um, the SS are being pushed out of Vienna now. They're pressing towards Prague. The Allies are overrunning concentration camps. They've, the Soviets have already done this in Poland previously during the Vistula Oder Offensive. So this is really when um, the horrors of the Holocaust are coming about. I mean, people knew the Germans had death camps. The Soviets had already captured a concentration camp back in 1944, but now the extent is being discovered and publicized all over the world. <coughs> and then you have the last attack on Berlin. Before I get into that, you got any uh, thoughts, ideas, or notes? Not really, no. I think you've covered just about everything. The only thing I guess we did miss, um, to circle back to before the Allies broke across the Rhine, uh, there was that pocket that the Germans had uh, across the Rhine in the south, and that was a major threat to the Tassanese French army group. And I remember at one point the yes. Germans were close to actually cutting it off and possibly destroying it. So what do you think What do you think they would have needed to do in order to make that happen? I guess that would have been in late 1944. I'd have to read up more on that. I read about it some years ago, but it's been a while. Uh, the problem is, is that the South, for both for both Eisenhower and also for Rundstedt, is like their backwater. There's not considered to be—I mean, there's not considered to be anything too strategically viable nearby. And the terrain in southern southern Germany is the rougher terrain. But I don't know. I know that eventually they put Himmler in charge of Army Group G down there. And he was, he actually launched an offense, he launched a pair of offensives that actually shocking, shockingly had a lot of success, you know, call things considered. You know, considering how meager the forces were thrown in. But once again, the Americans in the area and the French are stretched. But the calmer pocket eventually is reduced after heavy losses. Uh, fun fact about that one, uh, my professor's at the University of New Orleans. His father was in the uh, Calmer pocket and surrendered to the French. Huh. Yeah, oh, yeah, another fact, too. As, as the Western Allies are pressing across Germany, the ones who are the roughest are the French. They're the ones... Uh, the French units, you know, they see this... Uh, the officers see this as a way to avenge 1940. So looting's very liberal, but also French units were the ones most likely to shoot prisoners. In 1945. I guess that makes sense, though. Um, yeah. Yeah, there are definitely some uh, instances of a few small massacres. 
Um, in the North, the British are the most restrained. Uh, one person said that, you know, one British officer who wasn't sent to the front until 1945 said, back home I was told I was on a crusade to save Europe from evil. He said, I got to the front and everybody thought it was kind of a sport. It was kind of a, a, a good, clean war against a sporting enemy. Damn. Yeah, from what I understand, too, with, I mean, the, with, battles, you know, still. with the German werewolves, yeah. you know, the guys who were resistance fighters against the Western Allies after the, uh, well, early on during the occupation, apparently they concentrated their efforts against the French in their sector because I guess they felt that the French were more of a problem than the Americans and the British. Maybe. There's also the French are going... The French are in the very south, so they're going to the roughest terrain. And also Bavaria is, like, the seat of Nazism. That's their strongest... That's their support... That's their support base within Germany. You know, one of the ironies of Berlin being Hitler's grave is that the Nazis never did well in Berlin before 1933. Um, and the actual Nazi party of Berlin, with, like, guys like Goebbels and Strasser were the more anti-capitalist or at least capitalist skeptic variety as well. So, you know, if, I mean, if Hitler was really going to, I mean, dying in Berlin, it being, you know, the, 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 the capital of Germany, I mean, of course he's going to do it there, right? But if he really wanted to, like, die with his people, he would have died in Bavaria, not Berlin. Um, at this time, of course, Eisenhower said that he was afraid about a Bavarian redoubt being created for Germans to resist into the winter um it's a bunch of bullshit like the oss told them it wasn't going to happen the frontline commander said there's zero evidence of this but eisenhower did not press on to berlin uh, now there's been a lot of debate about should he or shouldn't he have the shouldn't have section says that hey that would have just caused post-war problems with the soviets and um who says the germans wouldn't have resisted and I'm like, well, most of the evidence I says indicates the Germans would have just said, yeah, we surrender. Because, you know, a lot of these Nazi leaders, like Himmler in particular, they're kind of hoping the Western allies are going to get more territory because they believe they'll be kinder and gentler, right? But they're also trying to see if they can treat with separate groups. So Himmler at this time is making peace overtures to the Western allies that are turned down, of course. But the Germans in Berlin are hoping the Western allies come. Now, does Eisenhower know that exactly? Not exactly, but he's just seen Western Germany just kind of surrender in mass, really. So I think he probably should have made the dive. And apparently this led to a, there was actually a big dip in American morale in late, in uh, early April 1945 because Franklin Roosevelt died. And then right after that, the units that were like poised and ready to go to Berlin were told not to. Huh. Yeah, now, interestingly about that, too, you got these German soldiers who are coming over en masse to surrender. Like, I think the estimate is saying, like, hundreds of thousands will surrender to the Americans in the last week of World War II as they escape from Berlin and the Oder Line. And the Americans accept them, uh, except for SS. There was the idea the SS would be turned back over to the Soviets. The SS, like, you know, got rid of their papers, destroyed their uniforms. They, they could not look like SS. Which, by the way, if you were in the SS, you actually had a tattoo on your left arm to identify you. But the Soviets didn't actually know that until months later. Stalin complained about that. So, when the Germans surrendered to the Americans in, like, the Prague area, they were turned over to the Soviets. <laughs> Um, at that time, too, a Schoner, who was telling his men fight to the death and executing them in the last days of the war, guess what this asshole does? What's that? As soon as he knows that he's, he's going to be surrounded by the Soviets, he gets an airplane and surrenders to the Americans. So Schoner is then sent to the Soviets, and apparently while in the Soviet prisoner war camps, his men would berate him. Um... It's a very unpopular man, of course, because, you know, he had executed hundreds, if not thousands of people in a, in a doomed cause. Yeah, and that guy was a first-class asshole. 
Yeah, first class. Which is, I mean, like, it's kind of what I'm talking about. I'm like, Konev is a ruthless Soviet commander in a very ruthless military machine. This guy's a first class asshole in a first class asshole regime. <laughs> yeah. No, I feel like uh, Schorner is kind of like uh, the most Nazi of all the Nazis, the purest of them all. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'll start getting out the Schoner Award for asshole, assholery, you know. But yeah, I, and that's why I said, like, I, I contrasted him with Modell, because, you know, Schroner was made a field marshal. He was, by Hitler's orders, the last commander of the German army. The commander of the entire German army at the end of World War II is him. And, you know, Modell uh, at least has the goddamn common decency to shoot himself. You know. Uh and Schroner's like, nah, nah, I'm going to surrender the Americans and abandon my men to the Soviets. <laughs> and then I'll, you know, coward. serve like a year in jail and then get a house in Iowa. I don't know, well, <laughs> yeah. that doesn't quite work out that way, but I think that's probably how he had it planned out in his head. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> it is interesting to note, too, about the uh, high commander trial of German generals. Like, you know, and you find that guys who were definitely involved in war crimes, or at least knew about them, like, say, a Rundstedt or a Guderian, weren't really put on trial. Now, Rundstedt was always loved by the British. They had this weird thing where they thought Rundstedt was, like, a gentleman and a genius. And the case of Guderian, apparently they didn't prosecute him because they wanted him to write papers on panzer warfare, for, on, on, on armored mobile warfare. So that's what he spent the first few years after World War II doing. Uh, never charged with anything. Wrote papers on mobile warfare, and then wrote, of course, Panzer Leader, and then died because he was in pretty crap health uh, by 1945. Anyways, uh, back to Berlin. Uh, the Soviets bust through the Oder line. Konev does it a lot faster. He was facing weaker opposition, but also his attack plan was better. Uh, Zhukov only breaks through to Berlin after taking very heavy casualties. The street fighting in Berlin itself... Is it's kind of taken on mythic proportions, wouldn't you say? Yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, how many world leaders decide they're just going to hang out in a capital and die while their radio plays Wagner? I can't think of anyone else. I mean, yeah. Um, and you also got to think about the, the all the high-ranking Nazis. I mean, they all kill themselves, right? I mean, Hitler. Himmler will eventually when he gets caught. Goering will while during the Nuremberg trials. Uh, Goebbels does as well. Goebbels is the only high-ranking Nazi who says, I'm with you, my fear, I stay in Berlin. Even though Goebbels and Hitler were not that close in 1945. Because uh, Goebbels had had an affair with an actress and had tried to leave his wife. And Hitler sided with his wife and said, no, asshole, stop the affair and stay with her. It was weird, though. Like, so, I, I can't imagine any woman who would want to have an affair with Joseph Goebbels. I mean, that was an ugly little troll <laughs> of a man. Especially an actress. He was, but I give Goebbels... Uh, if, if you had to ask me in that group who's, like, the smartest one, in many ways, it's either him or Goering. I mean, he was, a, he was an intelligent man. Um, and uh, could be very persuasive. Um... Him and Goering also had more charm than the other ones, I would say. Like, Himmler's got no charm. Uh, he's just a slimy little toad, you know? Uh, he, Himmler's just like a great bureaucratic warrior. Yeah, Himmler does not have much of a personality. He's pretty bland. Yeah, exactly. Um, Martin. There's also, of course, Martin Bormann, who was killed trying to get out of Berlin. Uh, but Bormann makes, like, Himmler look like... Uh, Makes Himmler look like James Bond, if you ask me. <laughs> oh, really? Because I, mean, I always thought I always thought of Borman as being a little more interesting, just because he seems to be so cunning. Because he's the secretary who, you know, is basically becoming ultra wealthy by getting his own and then getting appointments out of just being the guy who fucking handles Hitler's schedule. Well, yeah, but he was he was he's essentially head of the party. And increasingly had more and more domestic functions. And it's kind of interesting. As the Third Reich's collapsing, Himmler and Bormann have formed s separate camps that are going against each other. Uh, to see who is going to be in charge after the war. And you're just thinking to myself, I'm like, these people want unconditional surrender. They are they, The Soviets are raping your women by the millions. I don't think they're interested in having one of you assholes in charge after this is over. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I don't know who anyway, will be in charge after the war's over, but I know who won't. 
Yeah, the uh, is good. The, 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 I think the thing I'd say with Himmler, the thing I say with Borman is that Borman is not charming. He is very cunning, like you said, though. Um, and kind of like Himmler is also like a master of that of bureaucratic warfare. Um, Goering actually is pretty good at bureaucratic warfare too. At least you know before he, you know, decide just to eat and drink and do drugs. <laughs> yeah. Um, the one who wasn't good at that stuff was Rudolf Hess. Uh, interestingly enough, he was really he was a, he was the only one of those top Nazis who didn't get richer. He actually still lived a fairly modest life. He didn't have a, he didn't have affairs like you know Himmler and Goebbels. They all had mistresses. Rudolf Hess had no mistresses. Uh, Rudolf Hess had Jewish friends. He he opposed Kristallnacht. He opposed Operation Barbarossa. Uh, Rudolf Hess though was kind of like Guderian. He's an ultra nat- a nationalist. That's what he is. Um, and of course, by this time Hess is in British captivity and kind of nuts. But anyway, you get my point here. I mean, the rest of these guys are like bureaucratic warriors who are essentially plundering Europe and Germany. And uh, But anyway, Goebbels decides to stay in Berlin with Hitler and will kill himself shortly thereafter. Uh, the fighting in most of Berlin is re- relatively a cakewalk. But the thing is, Zukov originally wanted to get Berlin for Lenin's birthday. Well, that doesn't happen. So he wants to get it before the May Day Parade. So he... Zukov sent in the tank armies. So the Soviet tanks are the Soviet tanks are sent into Berlin and are blown up in massive numbers. A lot of people do that, of course, are Hitler Youth, who are very small and nimble. Uh, another one is SS Charlemagne. You know about these crazy fucks? The French SS. Yeah. It's 33rd SS Panzer or 33rd SS Grenadier. Uh, they were wrecked in, their, in a few days of fierce fighting in Pomerania. They were being reconstituted in the area. Their commander went to the SS guys and said, Hey, uh, we got enough vehicles for 90 of us to go to Berlin. Who wants to go? 90 volunteers come in. And so they get in some vehicles. They grab every single bit of ammunition they can, and they ride into Berlin in the middle of, in the, before it gets sealed off. And then they get attached to... 11th SS Panzer Grenadier Nordland, which is um, uh, mostly made of one of the Scandinavian SS units. And yeah, I think the last guy to win a Knight's Cross was a member of uh, SS Charlemagne. And they were experts at blowing up Soviet tanks with Panzer Schrecks and Panzer Fausts. Well, what about, um, who was the, I'm trying to think, there was a unit <coughs> that was in Berlin. Fuck, I was, I'm blanking here, but... uh. Oh, okay, so there is an SS composed of British and then an SS for Americans, right? I think the American one is called the Abraham Lincoln, SS Abraham Lincoln or some shit like that. No, your Abraham Lincoln Brigade was <clears throat> was the ones that went to go fight in the Spanish Civil War. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't think they're able to recruit many of them. They're, they're I want to say they had like small 16 number guys. Of a very small number of British guys were recruited for the SS, but very, very fractional, very tiny. Um, so, yeah, very small group of them got recruited for the SS. Um, they might have been an SS Nordland, but I, I haven't read about the British SS contingent in a while. Um, but, yeah, no, they... Zukov rushing those tanks in leads to heavy losses... The fight in the intersection of Berlin is, of course, known for being ferocious. And the, the whole thing, of, I mean, the whole battle of Berlin, just, it, it's this, it really is this over-the-top cinematic thing. And, you know, Hitler himself was a fan of was a fan of romanticism, but also movies. Big movie buff. That's that's actually what him and Eva Braun used mostly t- uh, talked about a lot of the times, about movies. And, I mean, Hitler had to think of this in terms of grand opera and cinema, Right. Yeah, uh, the leader dies in his city. He kills himself to make sure that he's not, you know, made a prisoner or killed like Mussolini because he had heard about what happened to him. Uh, so <clears throat> it's all meant to be dramatic and over the top, and it is. Uh, so anyway, Berlin falls, and then within the next week, Germans flee to the west, surrender in mass, and the war is over. Huh. The Wehrmacht, 
as one person I think the comment section mentioned or the uh, stream said lost more men in 1944 than the previous years combined and they'd taken heavy losses in 43 with Stalingrad and, the, and Kursk in Ukraine but it's interesting to, I, I'm interesting to talk about this army one of the most ferocious and successful of all time being destroyed so utterly and thoroughly but of course, still being a proficient enough fighting machine to inflict heavy losses on its enemies all the way to almost the very end. Actually, no, to the very end. The Battle of Berlin is very costly for the Soviets. It sounds like in a way that Zhukov's tactics were kind of been up, though, just hurling in tanks to the narrow streets, full of tall buildings around. Well, Zhukov was never a great tactician. I'd say he was a better at operations and strategy. He wasn't, I mean, he didn't, he didn't like do tactical innovation. So for instance, not until Vistula Oder did he actually have dedicated sapper battalions to clear mines. Before that, he would sometimes just have people go through mines, especially like, you know, political prisoners. Fuck. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, Zukov compared to the operations of Rokosovsky, Vatutin, and Koniv. He's his his men typically suffered higher casualties by percentage. Uh, so Zukov, in many ways, has probably been overinflated in the West. But I say overinflated doesn't mean the man doesn't have talents, but he's very aware politically. So Zukov did not. I mean, Zukov would disagree with Stalin, but he wouldn't argue with him. He wouldn't fight with him. And you know, Zukov was a loyal communist. He had been early member of the Bolshevik Party in 1917. He was a cavalry officer. And he was acquiesced to, acquiesce to Stalin. If Stalin said attack earlier, he might say, I'd rather not. But if Stalin said do it, he'd be like, okay, I got you. He's a yes but guy to the extreme. And so he's very politically aware. So he, he wants to take Berlin at a time that's politically convenient. An interesting fact, uh, when Zhukov finds out that Hitler's dead, he, he calls up Stalin. And he's told that, hey, Stalin's asleep. He says, it's important, wake him. And he tells him, yeah, Hitler's dead. This was going on. And Stalin says, okay, that's great. Anyway, I need sleep. Can you not bother me anymore? <laughs> but by this, time, by this time, Stalin's already looking to reducing Zhukov's role naturally, you know, to not have a rival. But, I mean, you know, think about that in Zhukov's end. He's, 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 he's trying to do these things that'll make his political master happy. And it's not working at Berlin. <laughs> Um, and of course, infamously, Stalin essentially had Koniev and Zhukov race for the city, which means Zhukov suffers even more casualties because he's just throwing men in willy-nilly. But Zhukov never really concerned himself with his troops and casualties. That was not his concern. Um, most of your Soviet commanders really didn't. Um, I'm finding a lot of my research your average Soviet general is not really that popular with their men. Uh, Zukov definitely is not. One of the only ones who was popular actually died fighting East Prussia, but I can't pronounce his name off the top of my head, but it's like Chernavsky or something. He played a, an important part in the destruction of Army Group Center, but he died in East Prussia. But he was actually genuinely popular with the troops. Oh. I didn't know that. Um, Chuikov was very popular too, but I mean, he was just a hard bitten commander. You know, he, he was the kind of guy who'd be at the front with the men too. Um, Zukov is not that guy. Although Zukov did do a lot of frontal reconnaissance. Like, you know, before an attack, he would go to forward command posts and scan the terrain. And he kind of failed to do that in the lead up to Berlin. That was another problem as well. It's also, I guess, worth he mentioning also goofy uh, something idea. we talked about in the past, though. I mean, the, part of the reason why the Soviet commanders are more likely to do things like in person scouting is that they're significantly younger on average than, almost, than the generals of pretty much every other faction. I mean, most of these guys are only 40 to 45 as opposed to 55 to 60. <clears throat> yeah, although for the Germans, on the army group level, you stay in the rear. Army level, same thing. Core on down, they're very, like, at the front. You know, so German um, uh, losses amongst, high, amongst senior officers are pretty heavy during the war, especially for division commanders. You run into division commanders getting blown up and killed quite a bit. Um, so, uh, you got any, uh, other, uh, thoughts on the, uh, 
uh, the uh, Wehrmacht's uh, last years of existence, or last year and a half? Um, not really. I think we pretty much covered everything I can think of. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, the air war. I did forget to mention Operation like Bladenplate, which was when the Luftwaffe launched an attack on Allied air bases during the Battle of the Bulge. Um, they did inflict heavy ca heavy losses on the Allied air forces, but they in turn suffered much heavier losses. It's that's kind of like the Luftwaffe's death ride. Did you know the Luftwaffe actually had kamikazes at the end of the war? I didn't know that, but I'm not shocked. Yeah, the um, fanatical Nazi pilots were ordered to and did ram their airplanes into the bridges over the Oder River when the offensive on Berlin started. Uh, their major, who was in charge of it, uh, during their had a last party, cried. But then, of course, he sent the names of the dead to Hitler for his birthday as a birthday present. Like, these are the men who have died for you, mein Fuhrer. Oh, God, here's one for you. The main SS commander in Berlin, he had commanded 1st SS Panzer Division of the Battle of the Bulge, when told Hitler was dead, he said, uh, a comet has faded from the sky. He said something like that. <laughs> Damn. Like, he's a shooting star. I'm like, oh, God, you're delusional. <laughs> it also, that just sounds kind of homoerotic. <laughs> well, the SS is full of homoeroticism, but that's something to mention, too. You know, Berlin in the last week became, like, just one giant orgy. Did you know about this? No, but I'm not too shocked. I mean... It makes sense. When, when people think the world's ending, they just kind of start fucking. Yes. Uh, Eva Braun, after getting married to Hitler, she went upstairs, and she was shocked to find that in the floors above them, uh, people were just banging. Uh, so you had these, like, SS orgies. And SS people would, like, and German, SS in particular would go to, like, they'd find, like, you know, hot women who were around and be like, hey, I know you're hungry. I know a place with food. Champagne and air conditioning, you know, down the Reich Chancellor. So, um, you know, they get these like you get these like Hitler Youth, some of which are girls, right? And yeah, they just like like people at the time said like Berlin became essentially just this giant sex party as the city's being blown to pieces, especially with the SS units and other um, um, and other people were part of like you know the Nazi bureaucracy that were still in the city. I can only imagine it'd be funny to imagine so, yeah, like one of these really stern uh, generals, like a Patton or a Zhukov, <coughs> witnessing that through, through his field glasses. What the fuck? <laughs> it's not surprising it would be the case with the SS, though. Uh, the SS officers tend to be a lot younger. Uh, they're promoted based on merit and like combat prowess and fanaticism. Uh, but you know they had these. They already had like, you know, like 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 uh, they had those like the rituals they would do in castles and stuff. You know, and the SS had a very anti-Christian bent as well. I believe some years back, they uncovered some like, like in the 1990s in Berlin. Apparently, they found some SS bunker that was that nobody knew existed, and the SS guys who were in there like drew a kind of uh, like a painting of like heroic Waffen SS. While like cowardly Catholics ran away, <laughs> yeah, dude, that'd be funny. I, that should be sent to a lot of those uh, hard right nationalist types today who talk about Catholicism, but also talk about Hitler being cool. Uh, the Nick Fuentes types. He needs a link. Yeah, to that. I don't. I don't know. Is he? Is he like? Is he actually like into Nazism? And it, yes, or, and and or Catholicism. Okay, I don't know the dude, man. I, I've never no, he's, listened. He's 100% I've, I've been... in the both. And a lot of it is he's probably not very well read oh, on God. English. He's only 23, but he's he's hardcore into both. Uh, I saw some stream of his, well, it's through Drunken Peasants, but he was comparing himself to Hitler and saying that he, if he goes to jail, that he won't be the first great political leader to emerge from jail to lead a revolution. And, um, yeah, he kept he keeps referring himself to Hitler. Hitler's like his role model. Oh, God. Yes, it's extremely cringe, but what's funny is that he calls everybody else cringe. But he's sitting there talking about, well, I'm a genius, and I'm a man of destiny, and I'm a historical figure in the making, and um, it's it's bad. It's kind of funny, though. 
Also, it's very obvious that he is in the closet, although his rhetoric is very anti-gay, as you might predict. <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, there's definitely an anti... Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a strong anti-Christian bend to a lot of the SS, especially when you're getting involved with officers and, and people would be closer to Himmler and whatnot. Um, so, I, I mean... I mean, it's. I mean, Berlin's kind of an orgy in general, anyway. But especially, once again, amongst the SS and members of the Nazi bureaucracy. I mean, I think the propaganda. I was reading about the um, one of the propaganda offices there. Like seventy-five percent of the employees were women, very young women. You can imagine what happened there. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, Hitler had his last meal: vegetarian spaghetti. Apparently, he complained and said, "Hey, can you guys stop fucking up there?" <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to eat my I'm vegetarian. I'm trying to spaghetti. kill myself. Yeah, I'm trying to kill myself in peace and quiet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Hans Krebs kills himself along with Bergdorf. Um, they uh, they got wasted and then blew their brains out. Um, yeah, a lot of suicide. Like if you see, of course, you've seen the movie Downfall. That movie's yeah. just a series of suicides. <laughs> Like, yeah. everybody just shooting themselves. If they ever do another one of those, they um, do need to add the orgy scene, though, just to complete the picture. Yeah, they, they, they kind of, I mean, you know, they they insinuate it, because you see this as this thing's going, like, the people getting drunk and whatnot, right? But it just gets worse from there, naturally. I mean, well, yeah, they, they, yeah, they didn't show that. Well, they also made it look like the uh, Hitler's secretary, who's, like, kind of the main character in the movie, gets away, and... You know, they, they don't really tell you in the movie that, no, 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 the Soviets raped her. Like, you know, she, like, bad shit happened to her. Um, she didn't, like, escape Berlin on a bicycle with a German boy, okay? <laughs> yeah. So, anyways. So, uh, there, uh, there ends the, uh, there ends the whole thing. Do you have any, uh, closing thoughts or remarks on the uh, German army and its death throes? Uh, not too many, no. Um, one, one thing that does interest me, uh, statistically, the German army of World War II lost twice as many men as during the First World War, but had far fewer problems overall with discipline. I mean, there weren't any major mutinies or anything like that. And I find that curious, but I guess, to be fair, in World War I, there was sort of a general legitimacy crisis, just for every faction, pretty much, because of the boneheaded trench warfare that they were all subjected to. Uh, well, at least among the, the powers mm. where people wanted to be in the country they lived in, like Germany and France. And then for a lot of the other combatants, was... of course, you know, they're in countries that they don't really care about, like the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Well, there was a strong... Um, there's also, like, a strong... left in Germany. I mean, there was a communist... an attempted communist revolution with Rosa Luxemburg. Um, you know, so you, you did, you did, you did have that going on. Also, I mean, yeah, you know, the Kaiser's, the Kaiser's men and the Kaiser's war policies, especially in the Eastern front of World War One, are, are, are pretty ruthless. They're, they're, they're stealing food and starving people to send food back to Germany. The plan is to create a German empire in the East. That's what they're trying to do, right? Yeah. But on the other hand... The Kaiser is not terrorizing his own people, and he's not liquidating racial groups. There is no SS. Where remember, the SS has that tattoo. That tattoo is your racial group. Because that's the SS tattoo is for. So, you know, there there are a lot of continuities between uh, the Kaiser's Germany and Hitler's Germany, but there's enough differences to where and then once again, like were there breakdowns in discipline? Most certainly. There are lots of reports of breaks downs in discipline in 1945 in particular. Men are deserting their units. They are fleeing west. They're, some of them are refusing to fight. But, unlike Kaiser's Germany, there are squads that will fucking kill you <laughs> if they catch you. And there are bodies lining the streets. You know, hung up on poles in the whole nine yards. So... You know, um, <clears throat> anyways, so that's a big one. Also, I mean, like the German Navy, as I said, had done everything it could to avoid a mutiny. And in that regard, they were successful. The German Navy not only does a mutiny, that's who takes over Germany, Karl Donitz. And why, 
Why would Donitz take over? Why did Hitler turn to him? I think everyone else had betrayed him. So Himmler? he's just like, well, fuck it. I guess he's the next best guy. Yeah. The Navy had stayed true to its word. There was no naval people. There was nobody navally involved in the bomb plot. The Navy had continued to send U-boats out to die to the very end. Um, so I, I wonder, I, I want to look up and see what the last ship was sunk in the Battle of Atlantic. I think it was in May of 1945, even after the surrender, like one or two ships got sunk. So the U-boats kept fighting to the very end, and Donitz never really questioned Hitler. And I think that's, I mean, of course, like, you know, Goering and Himmler in his mind had betrayed him. Goebbels was dying with him. Also, Goebbels is a propaganda minister. You're not actually going to, like, hand over the whole thing to him, are you? Probably not. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's why Donitz gets to become the uh, head of state and oversee the uh, the final end there. <clears throat> he must have been in a shitty spot when he was trying to avoid prosecution after the war because he was literally declared Fuhrer. So, to try to yeah. <laughs> create any distance whatsoever, I mean, it's bad enough he already oversaw submarine warfare, which is probably going to doom him, but then he was hailed as Fuhrer. So, yeah, pretty well, fucked. Well, do you know what to... Well, interesting thing about Nuremberg is the U.S. Army was wary about the prosec- The U.S. military in general was wary of the prosecutions of Raider, Donitz, Keitel, and Yodel. And so, you know, one of them was, of course, the idea of like you know one of the crimes was waging a war of aggression, and it's like, wait, what country hasn't done that? Hell, which country of those prosecuting them hadn't done that, right? In the case of Donitz, the one of the ways Donitz is able to make sure that his his sentence is one of the lightest ones is they accuse him of unrestricted submarine warfare, and he says, wait, you've been doing that in the Pacific. And Chester Nimitz comes to his defense and says, yes, not only did that in the Pacific, I actually based some of my ideas, some of our tactical and operational ideas are based on what the Germans were doing in the Atlantic. And it's worth mentioning that the U.S. did it far better in the Pacific than the Germans did in the Atlantic. Well, their their opponent was a lot more inept. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Japanese anti-submarine tactics are pretty damn bad. <laughs> um, you know, like like every time I've read about that, like I, I read a small book on that, and and the author's contention was like, the, the author said like, of all the things the Japanese Navy did, they did this one the worst. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> anyway, I understand, you know, yeah, like, the, the um, uh, German, I mean, the American subs in the Pacific were just ranging about, just sinking fucking everything. I mean, Japanese ships would just randomly blow up and sink, especially transports. Yeah, but also, consider what kind of heavy warship losses they inflict. Now, your U-boats, they sink, uh, they do sink some ships, like HMS, the carrier, the carrier's Courageous and Ark Royal, uh, Battleship Barham... So the U-boats had major successes against major warships. But the submarines sink the battleship Congo, the aircraft carriers Taiho, Shokaku, Onrayu, and Shinano. And that's not minor. That's a lot of people. <laughs> that's a lot of ships. That's a lot of major warships right there. Um, and... Did they sink another battleship, or was it just Congo? I think it was just Congo. Um, I think the only other battleship in World War II sunk out in the open was Barham. Oh, I forgot to mention, the Germans did sink uh, uh, the Royal Oak, battleship Royal Oak, when the war started. One of the most daring submarine operations in all of history. Where they were, they like, the, the, the U-boat uh, commanded by uh, Gunther Preen snuck into Scapa Flow and then sank the Royal Oak right like right in the Royal Navy's main shipping base, main warship base. That's some daring shit, man. Yeah. No. But anyway, so yeah, that's pretty fucking daring. But once again, it was it wasn't a ship out in the open. It was it was at anchor at the time. I want to say Barham and Congo are the only two battleships sunk out in the open. And then, you know, so the uh, yeah, the submarine fleet was having a lot of oh, they sank two heavy cruisers at the Battle of Leyte Gulf. I want to say it was the Maya and the Otago. So yeah, they're all over the place, man. 
yeah, like you said, they're roaming about at will, sick them wherever they can. Um, I want to say by like summer fall of 1945, they're running out of targets. Yeah, and I want to say, weren't there a couple hundred U.S. submarines active at that time, just roaming about? I don't know if it was a couple of hundred. I know we lost about 50 something during the war. Um,. And of course, the submarines were really ineffective in the first year due to some poor tactical choices, but mostly because of like crappy torpedoes that the that the U.S. Ordnance Office refused to acknowledge were bad. Um, so, anyways, so no man, so um, so yeah, no, so Donuts, that's how he uh, he essentially gets. There's a I don't know if you call it a fanboy letter, but a Chester Nimitz essentially bails him out of getting a worse sentence. Huh. Yeah. But Nuremberg, I mean, that's a subject that could be covered in another one. I'm going to be reading on the uh, Japanese war, crime, war crimes trials in the next few months. That may be a good one to talk about as well. Um, you know, and I mentioned the SS a lot in this one because they're very crucial and in the war, but especially in the last year of the war. But the SS has always been a military group that's fascinated me because, um, you know, it's, it's some of the units are elite, some of them are absolutely horrible. Um, it's a multinational force made up of hardcore anti Semites and anti Bolsheviks, many of whom conflate the two. Um, you know, just, um, it's kind of like a, a kind of Praetorian Guard, or not really Praetorian Guard, but like, um, Kind of like Hitler's attempt to have a Napoleonic Imperial Guard. Right. You know. Um, one which one of which he orders them to strip their like their armbands off after they do poorly in a harebrained offensive that shouldn't have been done in the first place, right? Um, you know, so anyway, yeah, it's just uh, fa to, to me uh, a fascinating and very dark subject matter. Um Waffen SS and SS in general is one of those first things like, you know, exhibit A or B in the, uh, if you want to argue the case for misanthropy. Yeah, for sure. I think there was also a unit, uh, yeah. that later came to be known as the Devil's Brigade, but they were like SS soldiers who escaped prosecution by signing up for the French Foreign Legion. And I think they served for another 20 or so years in French's colonial wars. Yes. Yes, um, that unit did exist. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a, one, one of the, um, there's a few accounts, uh, first in accounts I've read the Eastern Front. There's In Deadly Combat, that's a good one. There's The Forgotten Soldier, which is like really over the top and harrowing. Uh, it's the most horrible shit I've ever read is in that one. He's a F Alsatian who got drafted into the German army and ends up in the Gross Deutschland division. And I want to say they forced him into the French Foreign Legion or something like it. Or maybe they didn't. I looked that one up, actually. Um, no, anyway, um, let me look him up real quick. Look that up real fast here. But um, yeah, but a lot of them, I think some of them were also not just SS, but I think some of them were French SS. Although some of the French SS who were caught were just executed by the French soldiers who found them. Right. Um, yeah, but let me uh, let me look up let me look this up to make sure if the author of Forgotten Soldier was in the Foreign Legion. He became a cart. He actually died. This guy I'm talking about. He died. Oh, like two weeks ago. What? Yeah, he was a comic artist. Yeah, he was a cartoonist. Looks like he did not. But yeah, he fought in the Eastern Front from um, 1942 to 45. Although I think in 42 he was mostly just doing rear area stuff like garden trains, and then he got sent to the front. Um, but like 43, 44, 45, and then fought the British in a skirmish and then managed to surrender to them. Mm. Um, also, oh, that's right, he did not... Um, he did not, uh, that's right, I don't think he was drafted. It looks like he was, uh, 
he actually willingly joined the Wehrmacht. But anyway, so so yeah, that's the German army. I I, I don't think there's yeah, there's not too much else I'd want to say except that, of course, you know, the, the end of the First World War had left the general staff intact, which allows Germany to rebuild its military might. But the general staff is liquidated after the war. And particularly in West Germany, where lots of memorials to German soldiers of the past, the non-Nazi regime, are even removed in what was called denazification. And it's interesting to note that the West German army went out of its way to make sure their soldiers didn't have the same uniforms as those of the Third Reich. They also went out of their way to make sure that the high-ranking officers of the West German army were, um, if not members of the bomb plot, had at least been sympathetic to it. Like, so, for instance, um, one of the heads of the army was Lutwitz, who was um, the commander of Ninth Army in the Vistula Oder Offensive, uh, good general, uh, very loved by his men at the front lines, and he had protested continuously about war crimes. So you need to get guys in there who didn't have the stink, the full stench of war crimes on them as well. But it's interesting to note that the East German army, they actually retained some of the Nazi uniforms, or at least uniforms of a kind of Nazi, they had more. They were they were more lean about German generals being commanders who maybe had sketchy records. Although they tend to try to favor ones who are communists. That's another thing to mention too. Germany still had lots of commies, of course, because the communists that Hitler went after were usually not the rank and file. It was the elite of the German Communist Party. So when Soviet soldiers came in, they were welcomed by German communists. But apparently those German communists said that they were oftentimes abused by the Soviet soldiers who would say, why didn't you become partisans? Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> anyway. So, um, do you want, to, uh, you want to say anything else? Do you want to get into some super chats? Well, we can go ahead and jump into the super chat. And it's a good thing I wrote oh, them Oh, God. It looks like Walter. Oh, my God. Modal is in the chat. Yeah. He made it uh, oh God. <laughs> back from the dead. Um, so, it's a good thing I wrote these down, because once again, YouTube failed to preserve them. Uh, we had one that came in before the stream started. Unfortunately, when that happens, I lose any record of who gave what or said anything. That was for one ninety nine. Thank you to that individual. Uh, the next Super Chat we got was from Lioski for one ninety nine as well. He didn't leave a comment, but uh, we appreciate the donation anyway, Leowski. And then we get our first question with Nathan Center for four ninety nine. He said, Happy New Year, gentlemen. I hope y'all are doing well. Excellent topic. Well, thank you, Nathan. And I hope that you're having a great New Year as well. Uh, next up, we have one from Sean Mack for $10. And he said... Uh, well, thank you, Sean Mack. Also, he said, A note is that the German Navy was very much not true believers in general. The most famous is Lansdorff, but also people like... Um, is that Lutchens? Would back would back Lutgens. talk Hitler, just as an example. Yes, Lutgens absolutely hated Hitler. Lutgens was in command of the Bismarck when it sank, and when Hitler toured the Bismarck, like, the guys near Lutgens, like, gave, like, Nazi salutes because it's Hitler, and Lutgens still gave him the old Navy salute. Um, and yes, uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, one of the men who won the Knight's Cross in the German Navy was a Jew. A variety of naval officers were Jews, and the Navy refused to turn them over. The Navy retained a certain amount of autonomy in that case. What I, of course, meant was that Donitz takes over, more pro-Nazi guys get promoted, but it's especially prevalent in the U-boat force. In the late, the late war German U-boat force is packed with true believers because essentially like that's the only way we can get these guys to go out and die. Um, but yeah, also early U-boat force, not particularly like um, like Gunther Preen, Otto Krischmacher, who was the uh, leading U-boat ace, he wasn't too big on Nazism. That being said, there was one, um, Shepik, I think was his name. Uh, he was, and he, he also looked the part. I mean, he looked like an Aryan super soldier. So when the Nazis did like a lot of U-boat propaganda in the early war, they would go with him. And he actually, I think he wrote, wrote a book about it and everything. Uh, anyway, he died when a destroyer rammed his U-boat 
in early 41. Damn. All right. Uh, yeah, I think he was in the conning tower when it struck. <laughs> well, I guess that's one way to deal with the U-boat. Yeah. Was it on purpose or did it just happen? Uh, what do you mean? when the, Oh, yeah, it's on purpose. I'd have to read up the circumstances exactly. I'm imagining the destroyer must have been in the fog. Because I can't see, or it must have been bad weather, because I, I can't see Shep Peak. I mean, he was a good U-boat commander. I, I can't see him just, like, hanging out in the surface waiting for a destroyer to ram him, you know? Yeah. All right. Um, next up, we have Nathan Center, 499. Thank you, Nathan. He said, it is amazing but understandable that the Wehrmacht lost more soldiers in 1944 than all previous years combined. The odds had become overwhelming. Uh, I think that's a pretty good point. I mean, when they're getting barraged the way that they are with Soviet massed artillery, we talked about the tens of thousands of guns, uh, they're having to deal with major offensives on every front, Hitler's ordering counterattacks. It all makes sense. And if you add in the casualties from... Uh, you know, the daily aerial bombardments from the Allies, and that adds up pretty quick. Did you have anything, Sean? No, no, it's essentially correct. Uh, they should also be known the Germans, I mean, yeah, especially with Kursk. Kursk is just so important because they lose those armored reserves. A case can be made that if they cultivated those armed reserves and just tried to fight the Soviets back, kind of like Operation Mars style, where, you know, they make a penetration and you launch counterattacks. Because Operation Mars, one of the reasons it's a German victory is they have like six panzer divisions in reserve. That's a lot. And then, you know, you get to like, you get to a uh, uh, Bagration and what is it? Like, a, yeah, that's right. They had a panzer division. I ain't gonna work. Especially when you're outnumbered, what, what was the number of 4,000 to 50? What was the number you gave? Uh, they had a little over 100 tanks. That, that Panzer Division only had 50, but they had, they had, you know, they had Panzers strewn about some other units. The Soviets have under a little under 4,000 tanks. Yeah, that's not going to work. I want to say the advantage was roughly 38 to 1 in the Soviets' favor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that, 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 that's, about, that's about as crushing as it gets. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up, we have a huge donation from Oreo Resti for ninety nine ninety nine. Damn, sir. Thank you. He said, I've been meaning to donate for a while. Finally have the extra scratch to give. If you find yourselves in New York City, I'd love to buy you a beer. Any thoughts on a stream about one of the lesser-known theaters like Greece? Yeah, I could. Um, if I'm ever finding myself reading about that, I'd be interested. What do you think? Yeah, I think we could do that at some point. Um, I don't have a book on that subject, though. I have read a little bit about it before, Um I mean, I guess that'd basically be the Thermopylae campaign, and a lot of it would deal with, so you start out with the Greeks holding the Italians back, and then, of course, the Germans eventually break three of the British intervention. It's a pretty interesting campaign, actually, and the British have to abandon a lot of equipment when they leave. Um, so I think it, it is an interesting campaign, and it's also a really good opportunity to talk about, uh, you know, the many failures of the Italian army in World War II, the many amusing failures, in my opinion. Also, what I consider Churchill's biggest strategic mistake of the war was shifting the reserves out of Libya when the Italians are almost done. Yeah, and also so it kind of put a little bit of a... Libya, probably put a bit of a stigma on uh, Jumbo Wilson, who had to go to Britain with the forces there and then abandon a bunch of equipment because that kind of took him out of the running for any major commands because it was technically a fiasco. Not his fault at all. But it's still a fiasco. Yeah. Oh, and then you have to talk about, of course, the assault on, on Crete with the uh, Fulschenjäger. Yeah. Massive airborne attack. And the Indiana um, Jones-esque yeah. resistance led by a British archaeologist. 
<laughs> and also, um, one I'm one I have a lot of interest in is the Italian campaign. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. This, those are things we can definitely think about, and uh, I think those would work pretty well as topics. Um, let's see. We also have another one also, from. Oh, go ahead. Yes, I'm down for the beer, and thank you for the donation. By the way, I just want to add that. Yeah, very generous donation, and uh, if I'm ever in New York, I'll let you know. I've actually never been to New York. Uh, all right. I've been a few times. One of my favorite cities. Uh, next up, we have Bryce Henderson for 9.99. Thank you, sir. He asked, "Is Livy a reliable source on early Republican history?" I remember a questionable passage where he said that legions refusing to fight because of plebeian discontent was solved through decimation. Um, I don't consider Livy or any other source terribly reliable about the early Republic. The alternative to Livy is Dionysius of Halicarnassus, and his agenda is basically to try to prove that the Romans were secretly Greek the whole time. So his account is even more unreliable than Livy's. Um, a lot of the problem with early Roman history is that the Romans did not really begin to record their history in earnest until about the time of the Punic Wars. And when they did first start to record <coughs> their own history, they're actually writing in Greek. And the Greeks were not super interested in Rome until about that same time, maybe a little earlier, when they came into contact with the Greeks of South Italy and were starting to conquer them, and then you have Pyrrhus who comes in. But before that, the Greeks were aware of Rome, but they weren't super interested because the Romans weren't a threat. Once the Romans actually start conquering Greeks, then the Greeks get really interested. And I think that's at the time when the Greeks go to the Romans and say, what is your history? Where did you guys come from? How did you guys develop? And the Romans are like, wait, we're supposed to record that? Do what? So the Romans, in many <laughs> ways, funny. actually kind of made up a lot of the early shit in their history, to, to a certain extent. So a lot of the details you see in a, an author like Livy or Dionysius of Halicarnassus, some of those things are kind of made up. Um, at least that is my understanding of Livy's early work. Now, it's interesting and you know it's fascinating, but it's just not... Uh, I wouldn't put much stock in a lot of the details. And it's for that reason that most Roman history classes, even ones that are specialty classes at the university level, only really start in about the Middle Republic. is is because so much of what we know about early Roman history is so tentative. Yeah. And I mean, in terms of the plebeian versus patrician struggle, the struggle of the orders, um, the events of that are very repetitive, and that in itself is kind of suspect. Because you have a, 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 basically you have at least what two or three secessions of the plebs. You have constant bickering over whether they should go to war or not, with the plebs always saying no, the leaders saying yes. They go to war, the plebs get poorer and poorer, they come home, and then people try to put them into debt slavery, and then they revolt. Um, so it's like a pattern that you can kind of see playing out in more contemporary times when these histories are actually being written. It's unclear if that was actually the case early on. But certainly when these are when these things are being written down, those kinds of problems are actually occurring. So, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's possible that the Romans just kept making the same mistakes over and over and over and over and over. But also, I think mostly it's just that the writers who were contemporaneous with, say, the late Republic... Uh, and both Livy and Dionysius, by the way, are both writing in the time of Augustus. And those are the two definitive accounts. They're very much basing it on recent events, trying to find parallels. So uh, you see a lot of echoes of the late Republic and <coughs> early Empire, and that's not a coincidence. So anyway, those are my thoughts on Livy. Uh, next up we have... Uh, Jordan Hickey for $25. Thank you, sir. He says, I love your stuff, guys. Did they use the SS like the political officers in the Red Army to spy on and ensure loyalty, or the Gestapo? Or were the, their um, Nazi political officers embedded with army units? 
Um, I think there were some who would be kind of like undercover, if you will, that could be supposed to report. And not simply to report like if you were not a loyal Nazi, but just like a way to report on morale, I think. But don't quote me on that. But no, the SS were not treated like, like commissars in that sense. Um, and the army would have definitely been against SS being embedded. I mean, the army did not like the SS from the get-go. So we mentioned, I mentioned the SS getting lavish with equipment at this time. That wasn't the case in 1939-1940. The SS were actually given, um, in some cases, given inferior equipment, uh, like the submachine gun. Like We always think of the classic NP-40 submachine gun. They were given this, the submachine gun before that. That's the one they used. Which, I mean, wasn't a bad submachine gun, but it wasn't the wasn't MP-40. Yeah, I want to say that one was uh, actually so no, a they, World War I weapon, right? It's that one. It's actually, it's in, it's uh, one movie, that, one movie I've seen it in is Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Some of the German soldiers have it. It's one that has a side clip. Oh. Okay. It's, normally it's, I mean, it's, side it's not a bad gun. It's the British you know. Sten. Uh, but, you know, it's clearly not what the Nazis were using. Like, Wait, what'd you say, man? Yeah, when I think of the side clip, I think the British and French had side clip submachine guns. Yeah, the British definitely did use some side clip submachine guns, especially in uh, commando units. The Sten, and then I, I don't know what the French weapons are. And, and then the Italians actually had something that was not dissimilar to uh, the MP40 or the Sten. I think it was made by Beretta. It looks pretty cool, mm -hmm. but apparently it's not that great. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I basically, yeah, what, what Sean was saying, I, I mean, I think the Gestapo could investigate the army at times, but for the most part, I guess, you know, the Gestapo was a separate sphere from the army. Um, oh, it certainly did. I mean, uh, remember, we were talking about Heinrichi earlier. He was supposed to get executed at the end of the war for disobeying orders. Um but yeah, they they didn't uh, they didn't do um, which uh, in many ways probably also led Lee. I mean, Hitler Hitler's having a power struggle with the army the entire time he's in charge, and you know what he's trying to do, and he's doing it more haphazard than Stalin did. But Hitler is through the World War II is doing a purge of the army, especially in its upper echelon. Um, but the um. But there's no, like, devoted commissar units. Um, and then they probably would have been later on, I would guess. You know, uh, Himmler seems like Himmler's long-term goal was to actually replace the army with the SS when the war was over. Yeah, I mean, I would not be surprised if that were the case. Uh, especially Himmler wanted to control it personally, and the SS was his bailiwick. And if you notice over the course of the war, the SS steadily grows larger. To the point where it's a state within a state, and it's about half the half of Germany, at least in terms of the bureaucracy. Yes, exactly, um, and they're overseeing so many things. You know, police functions, um, various death camps, factories, and of course, you know, wielding uh, these uh, multinational divisions. And hell yeah, like I said, the SS expands to where by the end of the war, you have two SS Panzer armies, uh, 6th and 11th. Although 11th is more like a corps, really. That's Steiner's men. You mean the Steiner that was supposed to rescue Germany at Berlin? Yes, Felix Steiner. Um, I think he had been head of SS Viking. Uh, anyway. Okay. All right, well, uh, next up we have one from Nicholas, uh, $10 Canadian. And... This will be a little bit harder because he wants Sean to read this. I guess what we'll have to do to make this work is I will read it, and then, Sean, you have to repeat it. Okay. Well, okay. That never happened. That never happened. And if it did, it wasn't a big deal. And if it did, it wasn't a big deal. And if it was... It was an accident. If it was, it was an accident. And if it wasn't, he had a good reason. If it wasn't, he had a good reason. And if it didn't, then Severus Alexander deserved it. 
If it didn't, then Severus Alexander deserved it. Yeah. So what uh, is this exactly a reference to? Uh, <laughs> Nicholas created a kind of prayer to El Gobbles, basically saying he didn't do anything wrong. Mm, got it. Uh, and also, that he has a follow-up uh, super chat as well that actually kind of contextualizes this a bit. Uh, Five dollars Canadian. Thank you, Nicholas. And he said that he was in the Latin um, LLPSI Discord. They gave me a warning for my Elagabalus prayer. They're enemies of the channel. This is your first YouTube beef. Well, good to know. I'll have to uh, <laughs> have to put a little Great. bullseye on the wall with their name on it. So keep that in mind. Drama alert. Yeah, that's that's ridiculous. You got a warning for that though on Discord. I mean, that does not really what terms of service could that violate? I don't get it, but okay. Anyway, I don't know what that's. I don't know what that particular Discord is. I've never been there, but apparently they are not big fans of Elagabalus, which is not cool. Okay, so next up we have uh, four ninety nine from Nathan Center. Thank you, Nathan. He says the SG. STG-44 was the first assault rifle. I used a mid-range cartridge, the 8mm Kurs, as opposed to a pistol or cartridge or full-length rifle cartridge. Hmm. Okay, so is that what makes something an assault rifle? I, I didn't know that for sure. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not a big gun person. Uh, most of what I know about guns comes from Call of Duty. Uh, although I have fired a few weapons in person, uh, my uncle had an AK and an AR-15, so I have a vague familiarity with some of what those are, um, and how they work a little bit, but I, I can't say I'm anything like an expert, so I mean, if we're going into details about guns, I don't know. I know they fire bullets, mm -hmm. though. I got that part down. I know how to aim <laughs> one, so. All right, uh, let's see, where did I put the other one? Okay, here it is. Uh, next up, we have Seth Becker for $10. Thank you, sir. He said, just wanted to say thank you. Love the content. You two are in the S tier of YouTube history personas. By the way, what does S mean? Why is it above A? Well, uh, thank you, Seth. That's uh, very kind of you. S, at least so far as I'm aware, stands for superior. But I don't know exactly if it means superior, superb, superlative, but I guess any of those kind of work. Do you know what the S tier means, Sean? That's what I thought, superior. Yeah, so something like that, um, and that's just a thing that was, I left it on there, is sort of the standard template if you do a creator list, uh, whatever it's called, a uh, Tier list maker, S tier is at the very top, and I always have to add things below D because normally they only go to D. And a lot of it is to, if you're rating products, I guess advertisers don't want their stuff rated as an F. Uh, but, you know, some things suck. They need to get their F. So you got to add the tiers at the bottom to make it work, right? Yeah. Okay. Somebody said it comes from Japanese grades, but I uh, yeah I'm not familiar with Japanese grades. Although and a lot of video games, now that I think about it, you you do get S grades if you really kick ass. So I guess that makes sense. Like in Advance Wars, if you uh, clear a stage really fast, you get the S ranking. Anyway, uh, next up we have Akaminid Arsenic, great username by the way for five pounds, and he says, guys I know. I know it all looks bad, but the war is still in our grasp. Just wait for Steiner. Just wait. <laughs> Steiner! <laughs> Steiner with God, his ghost like he's panzers. Become... He's some, you know, do that whole downfall, to do the movie Downfall, and then, you know, of course, the downfall memes of YouTube. You know, popular God forever. Remember, like, 2008 to like maybe 2015. Yeah, everybody did they their own like version of the text, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah. <laughs> but you know, um, yeah, I, for that reason, I think Steiner has now become one of, if not the most famous German general of the war, now, at least on the internet. <laughs> Yeah, I think at this point he has as much name recognition, if not slightly more, than someone who actually did stuff, like, say, von Manstein. I, I, Rommel's Rommel. probably still better known than Steiner, but outside of Rommel, I, I think Steiner's, yeah. like, the second most famous German general at the moment. Yeah. Steiner was a very, uh, very uh, good combat commander, I have to say, though. Yep. Um,. Next up, we have Ben Gerber for $5, and he says, thank you, Ben. He says, ironic how similar Hitler's death was to that of the Jewish king Zimri. Great stream. Thanks, guys. I'm not familiar with Zimri, but uh, that is funny that he ended up having a, a death similar to a raging anti-Semite. Yeah, interesting. So I guess, uh, thank uh, you very much, Ben. Yeah, maybe he was in Jerusalem and it got I wonder stormed. If, I want, I'm gonna I'm gonna look him up. I wonder if he shows up in the Bible. Uh, I just finished the book of Genesis uh, about a week ago. I wonder if he's gonna show up later. Let me see. Hmm. Zimri King. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, we have one from Nathan Center. He says, for four ninety nine. thank you, sir. Sorry for the weapon trivia. Well, no need to apologize. It's all good. I collect military weapons. Actually have a Luftwaffe marked K98 Mauser. And they are awesome rifles. It's what I've heard. I've never actually used a bolt action, I don't think. But from what I understand, the K98s are extremely accurate and reliable. Um... Yeah, that's what I've heard too. And they're also very expensive at gun shows. I've I've only been to one gun show, but I recognized it from seeing it in so many games, and it, they display it prominently because you know a lot of people know what it is and want one. And I want to say that the K ninety eight that I saw, and this would have been around maybe two thousand seven. I want to say it was going for about fifteen hundred bucks. And comparatively, at least at the time, that was pretty expensive for a bolt-action rifle. Yeah, it used to go for cheaper in the 90s. I remember that. There were a lot more of them around, I guess. Um, yeah, by the way, that submachine gun, so I mentioned, it's an MP28. MP28. is okay. the, um, And it is actually a variation on one that was used in the First World War. Ah, yeah, and then when uh, Battlefield 1, you can use the MP18, which is pretty good. And somebody said the STG-44 right now goes for 40 grand. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't really, I mean, there weren't that many of them, too, you know? That's true. I, I don't know what is, the MP40 goes for. I don't know, I wonder, I guess it is possible, though, to make replica weapons and then try to... You know, sell them for a more reasonable price. There's probably a market for that, or you know, oh, definitely. modern STG forty four one that were fully functional, or I guess as functional as you can make it legally, and just for people who want to have a you know the, the weapon to mess with, get a feel for it, but don't want to pay a collector's price. Somebody's got to be in that market, right? I mean, I feel like that's a niche that's way too obvious to not fill. Oh, definitely has to be. And uh, Heliogobulus is actually a recognized spelling for his name as well. I just don't like it because it, it seems a little clunky to me. But there, it, I have seen texts that have Heliogobulus written in them rather than Elagobulus. So. Um, anyway, uh, last super chat comes to us from Nicholas for two dollars. Our two dollars Canadian. Thank you, Nicholas. And he wants us to know that Sean did not say amen. He is not a brother. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah, small mistake. 
Uh, yeah, I guess with El Agabos, if he <laughs> were here, if he wanted, if you wanted to make it good with him, you'd probably have to give him a BJ. <laughs> Fucking El Agabos. <laughs> uh, we just can't get away from him, man. <laughs> no, he is. Uh, he's basically the mascot of our channel. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Actually, if I, I I'm thinking at yeah, some point like... of possibly starting a merch thing, yeah. and uh, one of the things mm -hmm. is that maybe get a coin of Elagabalus and make a shirt out of it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> great idea. Yeah, and then anybody who knows who Elagabalus is but doesn't know the joke will be extraordinarily confused. All right, uh, we have another that's one inside, from... Uh, that's what internet jokes are for, right? Yeah. Inside humor. We have another one from Justin Ogle for $10. Thank you, Justin. He says, for whatever reason, Nazi-marked guns go higher. The STG-44 is an assault rifle because doctrine was large caliber rounds, but now we know speed penetrates body armor, which is why an M16, etc., is smaller. I guess meaning a smaller caliber. That makes sense. Yeah. Because um, I have noticed that, yeah, especially the M16, the bullets are smaller even than an AK-47. Um, but, uh, yeah, thank you for that. I wasn't exactly sure why that was. But, okay, makes sense. All right, well... Uh, Thank you, everyone, for showing up tonight. We had a pretty good turnout, I would say, and a good discussion of the late war Wehrmacht. What are we going to do next week? Yeah. I don't know. We should know that the last two Sundays of February, so that's going to be the... Um, well, actually, into March, it looks like. So, where's it into March? No, no, it's the last two weeks. That's right. The 20th and 27th, I am not available. Okay. Because it's going to be Mardi Gras and everything. Right. Okay. So, you've got me for the next two weeks, and I'm out for two. All right. Well, in that case, um, for one of them, probably the second one. Do you want to do the Ottoman generals of World War One? Sure, sure. I'll uh, I'll read up, I'll read up a few things. Read about Kamal for sure. Okay. And then for next week, though, we need a topic. Um, hmm. I have to consult our yeah, list. Mostly uh, when I'm. Yeah, mostly what I'm reading right now is uh, East Front stuff because I'm getting Vistula odor ready. Um, for the uh, Forgotten Battles channel. Our, uh, our, our Eastern Salmons video was demonetized because there's a Japanese corpse in it. Oh, so they so tried to make re you one of the Paul brothers. They tried to turn What's the Chick brothers into the Paul brothers because uh, one of the Paul brothers got in trouble for going to the Japanese suicide forest and a body happened to be there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was just like, you know... I mean, we just showed, like, you know... And a Japanese corpse on Guadalcanal. And one of the things is uh, interesting about that too is um, uh, you know, we peeled it and then we had to re-upload it and change the image out. And we called it in our description. We're like, yeah, they didn't really tell us why exactly, but we did this. Anyway, welcome to the family-friendly version of World War II. Yeah. The version where uh, there weren't any real atrocities or anything. The gentleman And men don't die the, horrible deaths. Yeah. No, I mean, trying to sanitize <laughs> war in that way is just absolutely brain neutral. Because it gives people a completely yeah. false if you impression. Next, if you want to stick with the uh, with something in the World War II vein, or if you want to go somewhere else, uh, the one I can do pretty well right now would be doing Zukov's career, just because I've been reading about him lately. Okay. Um, 
but but other than that, I don't have anything else that I would like be like too too big on, um, in particular. You know. Okay. I'm well, assuming the part four Stalin's gonna have to wait, huh? Yeah, I'll have to talk with Drees about that, but um, probably be a bit of, a bit of a wait. Um, but yeah, Zukov would be good next week. I might be able to get him to come in on that. We'll see. Um, and then Ottomans, and then when you're gone, I'll do a couple ancient things, maybe First Punic War or whatever. And okay, yeah, then we'll be back on track for March, and we can figure it out from there. All right, cool, man. That sounds good. Okay, Zukov next week. That sounds good. All right. Well, everyone, uh, thank you for joining oh, us. You and... have come up, actually. Oh, yeah, another one. Yeah, you're right. a few uh, super chats. Uh, yeah, one came in from uh, Nathan Center, 499. Thank you, Nathan. And he says he still wants a Belisarius and Narses knight. So basically, Justinian's Wars Reconquest. Maybe. I could, I could see, I could see that as an option. That could work. Um, thanks for the idea. All right. Well, um, I think we're gonna go now. I know I got Like I said, I gotta get up early tomorrow to do another one of these. So I gotta go, and I'm sure Sean. Which one is that again? I'm going on a channel no, called no, White Marks. Oh yeah, that's the one. And what are you yeah. talking about with them again? Basically, the sort of the politics of video games, I think, or how games can be used to transmit larger messages about culture, politics, what what have you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, everybody. This has been a good one. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. And that will be uh, the channel is called Bite Marks, spelled like this. And before it starts, which I believe will start at 10 a.m., I will post a text link to the video. But that's the channel name. So anyway, uh, we're going to peace out now. Everybody have a good night. Uh, those of you who actually show up to the Bite Marks thing, I will be with you again in less than eight hours. So uh, peace out. <laughs>